Norval Hayes Book and Tape Production presents Dr. Norval Hayes. I said, I come to this church one night and I was teaching the Bible, you know. And he said, there's a fellow sitting beside of him. He said, about midnight, mid, by midnight, he asked the guy, I said, why didn't you shave before you come to church? He said, I did. <laughs> I've been here so long, my beard's grown out. <laughs> oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to teach you today. I would like for the missionaries to get this message, but they're having a special luncheon today, and so, but maybe they can get the tape. I'm sure John will make sure they get a tape in their hands. But it's for everybody, but you know, you're on the mission field doing something for God. The devil wants to attack you all the time. He wants to discourage you. And uh, so you just have to know how to handle him. You know, I want to teach you this afternoon on how do I get the devil to leave me? How can I get the devil to leave me alone and how can I make the devil leave me? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me, please. There's several reasons why. There's several reasons what makes the devils leave you and several reasons why they don't leave you. And uh, so turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now, do any of you boys have those tapes and books that I gave you? When I come up here and I just stand up here with me and I'll give them right back to you. Now, you know, yesterday afternoon I spoke to you on Confession. The words of your mouth frames your whole life. And I do have a whole tape series on the power of confession. So your mouth controls your whole life. Your mouth builds a, a framework in your whole life. Jesus will be anything to you you, you you say him to be. Now, I've got some teaching tapes out there, individual ones. You might want to do some shopping and look around. And these are $5 a piece, or they're three for ten. So if you want to pick out three of them, now, one of them is since I just speak the word only. Now, you remember that scripture where Jesus was talking to the man? And, uh, and the man said, well, just speak the word only. Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. He said, I'm not worthy to come to my house. He said, Jesus, I'm not that good a Christian for you to come to my house. He says, but if you just speak the word only, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, oh my, 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 my. Boy, has he ever hit pay dirt. He said, I have no, found no faith around this part of the country as strong as yours. And Jesus spoke the word only and the servant was healed in the self-same hour. I said, well, it'll be with you too if you have that kind of faith. So I made a tape on speak the word only. And this one is called those things that be not as though they were. And forget not to give thanks to God. So if you look those over, you might want to pick you out some confession tapes after three for ten. I spoke on that. I spoke on that yesterday. Today I'm going to teach you how to make the devils leave you. And also I have a videotape. If you don't, if you don't think you might get it, just an audio tape. Confession brings possession in a videotape. You can take, go home and put it on the videotape. And if you watch that. If you'll watch me and listen to me teach that about 25 times, you'll get it. You know, you know my tape series out there, Prosperity of the Bible Way? I have a tape series on my table called Prosperity of the Bible Way. I had a fellow to buy that one time. There's a lot of millionaires in the country now because of that tape series. He said, you know, I... On this manufacturing company where I was making the furniture. Now he's only in his early tw he was only in his twenties. And him and another fellow were partners. They never could make a success out of it. They were building a special made oak furniture. Sell it to stores, couches, tables and chairs, dining room sets, the whole thing. He came to one of my meetings one time and I made that statement so he went out and bought that series Prosperity in the Bible Way. And I told him, I said, now you'll have to keep on listening to it till you get it. Now listen closely. 
He said, I never got it fully to listen to it 25 times. I listened to every tape in that tape series 25 times. He said, I didn't even start to begin to get it until, the, until it was the 18th time. The 18th time I listened to every one of those tapes, I began to get it in my spirit that I could be successful to any degree I wanted to. He says, and I kept on listening to them 25 times. By the 25th time, he said, I had it. And I knew I had it. And in three years' time, he was a millionaire. Three years. In three years' time, then he owned 14 furniture stores. 14 furniture stores in three years' time. And he's still in his 20s now. Now, I saw him here a while back, and he says, I said, how's your business doing? He says, well, he said, it's doing all right, but I had a slack time for a few months. I said, when's the last time you listened to my tape series? He says, well, I, I, I did, I have, I, 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 have, I have to admit that I have slowed down on that. I said, no, 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 no. If you slow down, you'll go broke. Just because you're a millionaire now and you're in your 20s and you made it in three years. I said, if you don't obey that the rest of your life, I said, the devil will come and steal your money away from you. And to, today, sitting here in this seat, always remember that. If you don't have any money, the devil will come and steal it away from you. Uh, if you're sick, the devil has come and stole your health away from you. If life is not full of joy and full of patience and full of contentment, the devil has come and stole life itself away from you. You don't even know what it is. You understand? The only kind of life that God gives is the kind that's full of faith, full of love. It just don't make no difference who it is. You love everybody. Rich, poor, broke, tall, thin. It don't make no difference. You don't have no judgmental spirit towards no human being. If a person needs help, then you're ready to help them. You understand? If you want to enjoy heaven now, my brother and sister, you're going to have to get it together. And if you're all messed up, and if you're, if you're not successful and you're all messed up, then you ought to know by that that you don't have it together. Is that clear? Just so you'll get it. If you're not successful, especially if you have any age on you, now I can understand young people, but if you're not successful and you're not living in joy and peace and health and contentment and life is not thrilling every day for you from the time you get up until you go to bed, if it's not that way with you, honey, you don't have it together. And you might as well know that. You don't have it together. But you can get it together if you want to. And you get it together by the matter of choice. And you can make decisions today to have a quality life, or you can make decisions to live a slipshod life, a broke life, a sick life, a beaten down life. You make any kind of decisions you want. But always remember this. God don't go by your decisions. In fact, if your decisions is not the same kind of decisions that Jesus makes, God won't even help you. He just lets you do your own thing. You're supposed to be living, if you want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you're supposed to be living in an abundant life. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I don't ever have any days one day up and one day down. I used to pray that I would die. I was so confused and so messed up. And Jesus come along and want me to pray for the sick and watch them be healed and I'm first Baptist. Now that's enough to mess anybody up. Yeah, that's right. You might as well know the truth about it. Jesus come along in my life and started wanting me to obey Him. And wanted me to act like Him. And wanted me to have the love and compassion He had. And wanted me to pray for the sick like He did. By the laying of hands. And wanted me to cast out devils like He did. And I'm First Baptist. Jesus pulling me one way and the Baptist pulling me another way. 
Jesus is trying to get me to pray for the sick and cast out devils. And the Baptist is trying to get me to be nice. That's a confused mess if I've ever heard a woman in my life. So I just had to go ahead and obey God. So I just went ahead and I said, well, I'll just obey God. But you know you can't obey God just because you want to? So I, it took me about three years walking around my living room floor like this. God, remove this Baptist mind out of me. Let the mind of the Christ come in me. God, remove this Baptist mind out of me. Lord, deliver me from all Baptist doctrines. Deliver me from Baptist doctrines. Deliver me from men's doctrines. All kind of doctrines, Lord. And put the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on the inside of me, Jesus. God, help me think straight. I don't a bit more believe. I said, God, I've been going to a Baptist church all my life. I don't a bit more believe when blind people come to the church. I don't a bit more believe they're going to receive their sight. And I believe that Castro is on the moon dancing in a peak apron. I said, Jesus, you believe it, but you're the only one that I know that believes that. My pastor, he don't believe it. Deacons don't believe it. I mean, how in the world am I going to believe it? I said, I don't even have any friends that believes it. I don't even have any friends that believes that blind man right there can receive his eyesight right now. I don't have not one friend that believes that. Jesus, you're the only friend I have that believes that. You know what he told me? He says, I'm your friend and I believe it. I said, glory to God. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I knew we'll forget about him in Columbus, Ohio. He started dealing with me. He said, I want you to cast out devils in my name. I said, no. this is really going to go over Jesus. And my family and my denomination and my friends, this is really going to go over. You want me to cast out devils? He said, that's right. He said, I want all of my believers to cast out devils. I said, oh, you do? I says, well, you've got a bunch of rebels, I can tell you that. <laughs> he said, just because they're rebels, that's no sign you have to be. I said, oh, <laughs> well. I said, all right, Lord, I, I said, I'll just, I just do it. He says, well, just live your life right. And he said, devils will obey you. You know what he asked me one night in Columbus, Ohio, years ago? You know what Jesus asked me? He says, son, don't ever stop casting out devils. He says, a lot of times people work for me and I promote them and they get a position in the body of Christ and they get, a, they get their doctor's degree or they get this, they get the pastor of a big church and they don't cast out devils no more. He says, a lot of them never did even start. He says, I'm asking you, don't get flaky on me. Oh, you, you just might as well know it. If you're not going to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, you're as flaky as a $3 bill. But Brother Norval, I'm a pastor of a church that's got 3,000 people. That means 3,000 more flakes is coming along. <laughs> you either obey Jesus or you don't obey Him. So I said, Lord, I'm going to I'm I'm tell on you. He said, good. So I wrote a book entitled, Jesus Taught Me to Cast Out Devils. And if you don't like it, talk to Him about it. But there's seven chapters in this book about demon-possessed people that's free now. All kinds of them in here. Like one little boy, one chopper, he used to set the schoolhouses on fire and try to kill all the kids. One teenage girl, that demon used to come and get her at midnight and drive her out in the woods and she'd dance all night long until the sun come up. Demons don't like daylight, they like darkness. They'll manifest themselves about midnight and they'll start driving you. When the sun comes up, demons quieten down, don't manifest themselves, and then you come back to your own natural self again, and your body's wore out because you danced in the woods all night. And then you go back home and sleep for a while and get up and try to kill all your relatives. That's what she did. When I met her, she told me, she said, I'll kill you. I said, you won't kill me, I don't die easy. <laughs> There's seven chapters in that book, Jesus taught me to cast out devils. Now you'll learn a little bit this afternoon how to deal. This is a tape series, how to deal with Satan and demons. I'm going to teach you how to deal with them. Thank you very much. Now if, that, if that young man comes up here about three or four more times and stands out like that, he'll be casting out devils for breakfast.
Well, that's the truth. When I find ministers that back, backslid and committed a sin and all messed up, you know, and don't have no hope and stuff, I tell them, I say, well, just come with me and go with me for two or three weeks and all hope will spring back into you again. And a lot of times they come with me and just sit there. And listen for two or three, four weeks, just sit there. And after three or four weeks goes by, they sit there and they watch me cast out devils and pray for the sick and teach the Bible and watch the Spirit of God at work. Man, they get so excited after about two or three weeks, they don't want to backslide no more. They want to get back in with, they want to get back in with the sheepfold of God. Jesus said, you can't ever taste of me and ever be satisfied with the world. You can't be satisfied with sin once you taste of Jesus. You've got to be kidding. You found the 28th chapter of Matthew yet? Well, praise God forever. How the question is today, how can I get devils to leave me? Or how can I make devils leave me? Well, you can make them leave you if you know how. And you're going to learn this afternoon, real quick like, how to make devils leave you and your responsibility and how you can make them leave you. You can make... You say, Brother Noble, I got cancer. Well, make it leave you. I, 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 wanted, I wanted you to pray for me. Pray yourself, you old lazy thing. I'll be glad to pray for you, but you can't just go around all your life wanting some other Christian to get things from you from God. Don't you know that your name is written in heaven? Don't you know that Jesus' name works for you as well as it does for anybody else? And don't you know that God wrote the Bible just for you? Anything I can get God to do, you can get Him to do it. I don't care what you look like or where you come from. You can get Him to do it. You say, well, I I don't. It don't work that way, Brother Norval. It don't work that way. I don't get Him. Devils don't leave me alone. They try to mess me up all the time. It don't work that way. It'll work. You know why it don't work that way? It don't work that way because you're ignorant. But this, after this afternoon, you won't be here no more, so it'll work that way starting tonight. Starting tonight! Bless it be God forever. You don't have to wait. 28th chapter of Matthew. Are you ready? I'm not sure you're ready for me. Bless it be the name of the Lord. I don't believe in nothing except victory. I believe Jesus is truth and all devils are liars. And I also believe, you say, devils? Oh, I believe devils are alive too, Brother Norval. What about this, these bad kidneys I got, or this bad back, or what about this unmessed up? What about my mind, Brother Norval? It's all confused. I said, I believe that's a lie too. Anything wrong, always remember, anything wrong with you, the devil put it on you. Well, throw it off of you. When I go to the hospital room, somebody's dying, the first thing I do is bind up the spirit of death and tell the spirit of death, come off of her! Get out of this hospital room in Jesus' name. I went in hospital rooms where they're dying and no hope for them and watched the Lord heal them in five minutes. And they would tell me that there's been 18 pastors in this hospital room in the last four days. And I didn't get nothing. I said, well, no wonder you didn't get anything. I said, they visit the hospitals to pray nice prayers. I don't visit hospitals to pray nice prayers. Are you kidding me? I visit hospitals to run devils off. You have to bind up the spirit of death. De- demons of death, they have a picnic in hospitals. You have to bind the dumb things up and run them off the room. Come off of that body in Jesus' name, you devil. Leave this person alone. Sometimes they just be there barely breathing. Uh, 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 I said, oh, sicko. Come out! <laughs> Make the dumb thing leave them. But when the devil turns them loose and the Spirit of God starts going through them, they wake up all of a sudden and say, what is this going through me? It feels so good. I said, oh, yeah, you said that right. When it gets through you, you'll be jumping the fence. All the healing power of the Lord feels wonderful. It starts going through you, glory to God. It drives, you know, the healing power of Jesus, it runs through your body like the wind. Search it out, go up your arm, hunting disease. And the final one that goes, ow! And the divine healing power of God will go down your legs and come to your knee that's weak and it'll go, Ow! 
and it attacks it. Did you know the divine healing power of Jesus is designed to attack diseases? Uh, well, get it thrown through your body and see what it does for you. I mean, you'll think you're sick all night. And all of a sudden, God puts his arms around you and starts healing you. In a few minutes, I say, where are you sick at? <laughs> I don't have any. It just left. Well, yeah, you said that right, it just left. The divine healing power of Jesus is designed to drive out diseases and give you a healing and a cure for your flesh. Do you understand that? Blessed be God forever. The disciples of the Lord Jesus started coming to him one time. You need to know the scripture now, but from what he said, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 17, and the Bible says, And when they saw him, the disciples were walking towards him, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Well, that's some that doubted don't get nothing. But the ones that had enough faith in him to worship him, they get a lot from God. Notice the 18th verse. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You're in the earth, my brother and sister. You're not in heaven yet. You will see and know and feel and enjoy the, all the power of God when you get to heaven. But you're not, you're not in heaven yet. You're here on the earth. Fighting demons and goofy people in the traffic. <laughs> well, you are. Might as well know where you live. Verse 19. Jesus told his disciples in verse 18, there says, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus said, Now go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. I got a phone call one time from a girl and got a letter from her first and she says, I want you to come to our church so bad I can't hardly stand it. Your teaching has helped me more than any teaching I've ever got a hold of in my life and your teaching has turned, changed my life around with the novel and I want you to come to our church so bad that I can't hardly stand it. And our people want you to come to our church because your ministry has helped people in our church. But said, you know, our pastor, he would really like for you to come. But she, she said, I belong to a Jesus-only church. And she says, and my pastor, he believes it's false doctrine because he says it's not in the Bible. About, you know, uh, baptizing people in any other, other name except just Jesus only. He says, do you have a scripture in the Bible where it says, baptizing, like you say on your tapes, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? He says, we just believe you baptize in Jesus only, that's all. But we all love you and want you to come to our church. Can you, can you enlighten my pastor on that? I said, oh, sure, honey. Matthew enlightens everybody. She said, well, give it to me. So I gave it to her. She said, oh, thank the Lord. It is in the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, honey, it's in the Bible. Right there it is, red letters. Book of Matthew. Jesus said, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. There's three in the triune Godhead, not just one. There's three. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, But if you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And the Holy Spirit is here on earth to do the work of heaven, to bring heaven's blessing to you. And the Holy Spirit is a performer. He does what you do. You understand that? That's the reason God deals in knowledge. God does not deal in ignorance. If you hear me say ignorant sometimes and stupid and dense, well, you'll just know that God don't deal with that. He wants you to get rid of it. If you, I, I used to be ignorant of everything. I'm still ignorant of some things, but I'm not as ignorant as I used to be. There is God forever. I've got the Baptist mind moved out of me, and i got the mind of Christ in me some. <laughs> Praise God forever. Because as long as you keep a Methodist mind, or a Baptist mind, or a Presbyterian mind, or a Church of Christ mind, you're not going to cast out devils. You're not going to run big ads in the paper and say, Come to deliverance service. Tonight we're going to heal the sick and cast out devils. 
To run an ad like that, you're going to have to be independent. Or either belong to some full gospel movement one. And sometimes they're not too hot on casting out devils. You know, you have to watch them. They're not, they're not fully in yet themselves. They're still wondering themselves about, well, I don't know. Somebody asked me some time ago, said, Brother Norville, are you the kind of person that sees a devil behind every bush? I said, well, I used to see a devil behind every bush. But now that I got saved and want to obey God, I see four or five devils behind every bush. <laughs> when you've been to heaven twice, my brother and sister, you'll just know by that. And you get to look around, you'll just know that everything that's wrong with a human being, the devil's behind it. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all the angels in heaven and all of heaven and the whole doctrine of heaven. They have no intentions of ever doing anything against you to make you suffer. That's not even in their vocabulary. It's not even in the, it's not even in the world of heaven. That's love and blessing and success and health. Anything that ever visits your life to cause you one minute heartache or one minute sadness, one minute confusion, it comes from the world of darkness. It comes from hell. It comes from devils. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Jesus has no intention to come to your house and attacking you with any kind of disease or making you and your family suffer. That is not his nature. He's not going to do it. You've got to be kidding if you believe that. But the devils have every reason. Jesus said devils are come for three reasons. To kill, steal, and to destroy. Notice verse 20. <clears throat> Jesus said, Also, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Teach all nations and all tribes of people and all churches and all the humans on earth. Teach all nations to observe whatsoever I have commanded you and I have said unto you in my word. Teach them to respect that and observe that. And then I will be with you and go with you even to the ends of the world. People say sometimes to me, Brother Norval, my church is kind of dead and dry and gone, you know, and I just wonder, I, I don't wonder why. I mean, you know, it's, we have, you know, kind of dead, dull services. We haven't had no landslide services lately, you know, and it's kind of dry and dead and cold. And, 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 uh, I mean, would you, would you pray for her church, Brother Norval? And I said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll pray for your church if you want me to pray for your church. But I said, why don't you return to God? Oh, we love the Lord. I said, bluebirds love the Lord. <laughs> Just seems like that God is not with us. Well, the Lord Jesus said, if you'll observe and respect everything I've said to you, everything, 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 everything that I've said to you, He said, I will be with you and go with you even to the end of the world. But once you start getting your own ideas in your own mind, well, I don't know about this healing business, you know, I'm raised as Baptist, and I don't know about this casting out devil business, you know, I just want to go to a church and be nice. And I don't know about this stuff, you know. I don't make no difference to me what Jesus said. I mean, you know, I just don't know what I mean. I feel, you know, I don't know if I want to get involved in casting out devils or not. I mean, you know, that is not my ministry, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, yes, everything in the Bible is your ministry. You know, you flaky, squirrely thing, you, everything in the Bible is your ministry. The whole Bible is your ministry. Do you understand that? And don't let some sacked out men's doctrines, you know, get into your mind and sack your mind out and say, you don't supposed to pray for the sick and you don't supposed to cast out devils. And you don't supposed to lay on the floor and make intercession for hours. That don't help any. Uh, really? 
It'll bring heaven down to earth. Blessed be God forever. Well, I'm not asking you to take men's doctrines or my word or anybody else's word. You have a Bible, don't you? Okay, now you know what Jesus said to you? Teach all nations to observe all the things I've said to you and all the things I've commanded to you and all the things I've said to you in my word. Jesus said, teach all nations to observe that, love that, believe that, respect that, and I will go with you even to the end of your life. Glory to God forever. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me please to the book of Mark, chapter 16. And we'll find out what Jesus says. You know, we human beings are real bad about believing whatever we want to believe. Well, if you really, really believe the Bible, if you really study the Bible and actually believe what Jesus says, now not me, I'm just, I'm just a human being like you, but I am telling you that Jesus, if you'll listen to what He tells you, He will set you free from yourself. Well, He will. He'll totally set you free from yourself. All right, the 15th, in the 16th chapter of the book of Mark, the 15th verse, He said, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be down. Well, that's the way it is. If you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. If you don't, you don't. You'll go into the, the valley of the world of the damned. It's just that simple. If you accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, you'll go to heaven and live with God, Jesus, the angels, the Holy Spirit, and the world of beauty. Glory to God forever. But if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to go there. You're going to live in a world of the damned forever. He that believeth in me shall be saved. He that believeth not in me shall be damned, Jesus said. He said, well, I believe in Jesus, Brother Norvalent. I want to obey Him. I believe in Him. Well, I'm glad you said that. I believe in Jesus. Look what He says right here. I've got, if you believe in me, Jesus said, I've got something I want you to do. First thing I want you to do, if you believe in me, the verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Everybody say, I'm a believer. All right. In my name they shall cast down devils. <laughs> no. Normal. I'm, I'm closing my ears. I wish I hadn't read that. I'm closing my ears. I don't want to hear that. I'll, I just want to go to church on Sunday morning and take my family and be nice. Isn't that normal? <laughs> that don't mean everybody. That is not my ministry. <laughs> That's just, that, that, that's just, that's a nice answer. You ought to see God's face when you tell him you don't believe him. I'm just trying to be nice to you. You tell God you don't believe his son, and he'll say, <laughs> Brother, you look Jesus Christ in the face and say, it don't make no difference to me what you say. I'm going to believe what I want to. You know what happens to you? You open up the door for the world of darkness and for demons to come in and just absolutely tear you apart. And you live, you, 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 you'll be like a tennis ball every time I see you. There'll be 14 things that's happened to you. Oh, what things? Well, just name two or three. If the devil hasn't given to you yet, he will. Because you, leave, you, you let the door open to your heart. You leave the gate down. And devils come in and just bounce you around like a tennis ball all the time. But if you listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and know the power there is in His name, the devil can't come to you and just bounce you around all the time. My daughter one time had 42 girls in her Bible. You know what God told me when He took me to heaven and talked to me about it? He says, How long are you going to put up with those girls in her body? I said, ah, Me? I've been praying for five years. I said, Me put up with them? I don't like the dumb, ugly things. I don't know what you mean, Jesus. Jesus, what do you mean? How long am I going to put up with them? I don't have them. Jesus, they're not on me. I don't have them. Jesus, uh, what do you mean? I, I don't put up with them. She does. And I, they're not on me. I don't have them. Now, when you talk like that, uh, God knows you're stupid. <laughs> and besides that, I was scared for even being there. I mean, let God pull you out of your body sometime and bring you up into paradise and talk to you. It'll scare you half to death. It'll stretch that Texas brain of yours. 
Yeah. Your body's saying you're living in a room crying and you're in another world somewhere where God's at. And I said to him, I don't know, not on me, I don't have him. He might as well say, oh, shut up. But he didn't. He said to me, this loud voice, he says, you're the head of your house. Oh! When he said that, I saw something. Inside Revelation. Everything that happened at my house was my fault. He told me I was the head of my house. I wish you men would find that out. You're the head of your house. What do you let devils come in your house for and attack your children or attack your family or attack you? Why don't you run them off? God asked me that. He says, you're the head of your house. Devils don't have no right to operate in your house or on your children. Why don't you make them leave? How, yeah, he asked me, he says, how long are you going to put up with devils? How long are you going to put up with those gross in her body? How long are you going to put up the diseases? I didn't put it on you, the devil did. Why don't you make it leave? I said, <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm Baptist, Lord. <laughs> well, it's hard to tell you. If you're a Baptist, it's okay to tell your friends that you're Baptist, but don't ever tell God. And if you're a Methodist, same thing. When you're standing in front of God in heaven and He's talking to you and He tells you to do something, what are you going to tell Him? I, I'm Presbyterian. Well, la ti da ta ta da ta God looked you in the face and said, yeah, and I'm victory. That doesn't beat God forever. And He is victory too. He said, now, if you'll curse the roots of those gross in my name and tell them to die, he said, the works of hell will disappear from your daughter's body and from your house and from your premises and run the devil off. He said, they will disappear. I come back and did it. And brother, I believe, he told me, he said, if you'll believe and not doubt, and I believe and not doubt for 40 days, I did it. When I first come back that night, I did it. And I believe for 40 days and 40 nights, and all of a sudden she floated in from school one afternoon. I went back in her room and I heard a big noise back there and all of a sudden here comes God's power through her room. And she looked down she said, I've been that way for five years and hanging up a dress, looked down she went, Ah! And all the gross had disappeared new skin had come up on her. You mean in your, you mean in church? Oh, no, you can't get that in church. <laughs> you get that from the book of Matthew. You get it from the book of Mark. You get it in your own believing. I got it at my house, five o'clock in the afternoon. God just came through and wiped everything off of her and put new skin up on her. She ran to the wall. That so scares you? You're like, dear God in heaven. See, you understand why I'm so wild? Well, let's let your daughter, daughter come in my high school someday, cover with 42 gross under them, split and a bit open, bleeding and stuff like that. And then walk by you like this, been this way for five years, you've been praying for... And a few minutes later, you heard a noise in the back bedroom, and you've been bleeding for 40 days and 40 nights after you got back from heaven. And then she comes tearing out of the bedroom, running down the hallway, going, Ah, look at me, look at me, look at me! And all the gross had disappeared, and brand new skin had come up on her body. That'll... That will totally set you free from your Sunday school lessons. <laughs> Glory to God forever. Everybody say, Jesus is a miracle worker. Jesus is a miracle worker. The devil is mean. The devil is mean. And boy, he'll put everything on you, you let him put it on you. But, but, but God told me, he said, you don't have to let the devil put anything on you. You know, you know the Lord told me, he said, you don't, you don't have no right to operate on your property. What are you doing? He, the, God thought I was stupid. I wonder why. <laughs> and I just knew I wasn't until I got in His presence and I knew I was. I want to call on the table. He knew so much more than I did. I want to call on the table. Oh, yeah, I want to call on the table, man. Are you kidding me? He wanted, he wanted to know, what are you doing putting up with gross on your daughter's body? Your name is in heaven. 
rise up with authority in my name, use my name, and curse those things. And speak words out of your mouth and say, die, and disappear, and get off of my daughter's body, and all you devils, get out of my house, get off of my property. He said, you tell devils, get off of my property, you can't operate on my property. He said, demons have to stand out there at your property line and go, <laughs> I want to attack your daughter. <laughs> no, you can't come across my property in Jesus' name. Over here we have victory, 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 victory. And they'll, they'll stand there for a few days or a few weeks, you know. You know what I mean? <laughs> I want to come over. But if you won't let them, then they'll go down the street to somebody else's house that don't know what the Bible says. And I always remember this. When they come to your house, and you don't know what the Bible says? They always find a bed on the couch and they lay there and watch TV with you. Oh, yeah. And one of them will say, watch church for tomorrow. That's, that's, that's the dissatisfied marriage devil, the lust devil. He'll say, watch search for tomorrow. And you turn search for tomorrow and he'll lay there. <laughs> He'll, he'll say, after you watch Dr. Kilpatrick come back into town and fall in love with Cynthia. It's never Dr. Snotgrass falls in love with Maud. It's always Dr. Kilpatrick falls in love with Cynthia. You understand that? And he'll say, you, and then he'll tell you, say, your old boyfriend, you come to that party, he said, you're your old boyfriend loves you too. Why don't you leave your husband? He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And then all kinds of demons just operate. They'll just do anything they want to to you. They suggest all kinds of things to your mind. All kinds of things to your mind. They tell you you're dissatisfied in your marriage. They'll start pointing out all your bad things husband, your husband has. And you have. All they do is get your attention. Get your attention. Devils are crazy people. Do you understand that? They are totally nuts. And they suggest all they are is a supernatural power of false suggestion to your mind. That's all devils are. And if they get you to think of the wrong thing, then you can't accept the truth. You won't, you won't accept the real. If they get you to think of the wrong thing, you can't accept the real. But don't think the wrong thing. Just know what God's will is for you. Read the Bible, study the Bible yourself. And I mean, they'll just, they'll lay around your house all the time. All that fussing and fighting and confusion and... You're not successful in business, you're not successful in anything, nothing will never work, all kind of trouble and heartaches. Your house is full of devils. Why don't you bind them up in Jesus' name and throw them out and run them off of your property? Run them off of your property. They've been there so long, fooling around, you know, so, well, Brother Normal, I love the Lord. I'm not devil possessed. I didn't tell you us that they hang around, they'll hang around your house and do things because of ignorance. You understand that? Or because you don't resist them. You have to resist them. You have to make them leave your property. Just make them leave. They'll just, see, devils float through the air. And you say, in Jesus' name, get out! And they go, boom! Well, I'll leave them. You know, if that's the way it is, well, that's the way it is. They keep it that way all the time. Jesus said, if you believe in me, well, right here, I've got some things for you to do. The first thing I want you to do is in my name, they shall cast out devils. And you say, oh, my God in heaven. Cast out devils? Me, by the normal? Me, cast out devils? Yeah, you. Yeah, that's right, you. Cast out devils. I can't do it. Yes, you can. If God can teach a First Baptist fellow, a First Baptist executive that's making $5,000 a week, if God can come and talk a First Baptist executive that makes $5,000 a week to give his time free for the rest of his life to tell people the truth, if he can talk me into doing that, he can talk you into it. I was the most unlikely prospect in the world. Are you kidding? I was, I was a nice fellow, quiet and reserved. You know what happens to me when, when God called me to teach the Bible after I worked in the ministry of health for seven years? Now when I come up and open the Bible like this and stand up here and talk to you, you know what happens to me when I walk up here every time I do it? It's been happening to me for years and years and years and years. You know what happens to me? I, not, I never have to hunt for words. Because the ball on the inside of me is so strong and, and make contact with my brain, I can't hardly wait to get them out. 
I could teach, I, I could teach you for five hours this afternoon. I'm going to have to quit in a few minutes and I don't like it. <laughs> but I'm a nice fellow. And I'm going to because I have to. But see, it's like when you see, on the, when you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you see the threshold of two worlds. You see in a world of victory in a world that you live in and you watch human beings suffer and you hate to see human beings suffer when you know that you know that you know they don't have to. If I could just get you to rise up with your own voice, your own voice in your own life and trust God and trust the name of Jesus and say, In Jesus' name I bind you devils. I command you, go from me. Now in my last moments today, are you, you have a pen and paper? I'm going to take this down so, you, so you'll know. What, what, how can I make devils leave me? Okay, remember what the disciples did when they first came to Jesus over there in that first scripture? Now look at me first. The disciples fell down at Jesus and began to worship Him. And they began to worship Him. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. The first thing that you're going to have to do to ever come to a place that you can make devils leave you alone to any degree is call the Word and put on number one. This is number one, honey. Submit. Submit yourself to God, which means that you are, you are willing and will put first things first. And first things first with God, but any human being is always worship Him. It's not go to church. It's not try to find some position. It's worship Him. Just like the disciples did, worship Him. Submit yourself to God to the point that you will actually worship Him and you'll actually do it in a room where nobody can see you. It's hard to do it in church too, but do it in a room where nobody... God said, what you do in secret, I will reward you openly. If you want God to do great things for you, come to a place that you don't have to have all of your friends, you don't have to have no human being, that you love God yourself, that you'll submit your own life to God yourself. God, you have my life. Jesus, my life belongs to you, Jesus. And submit your life to Him. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Then, after submitting yourself to God, you have to, you have to get delivered from your brain and get delivered from your past knowledge. Number two, I need to be delivered from my past knowledge of God. I need to be delivered from my past knowledge of God. If it's keep it holding me back from victory, I need, number two, I need to be delivered from my past knowledge of God if I'm not living in victory. Now, if you're living in victory, your knowledge is just fine. But you just might as well know this. If you're not living in victory, there is something wrong with your knowledge. And God deals in knowledge. God does not deal and bless ignorance. God never blesses ignorance. He only blesses knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of His eternal Word. He's promised everything to you in the Bible. It's already in there, honey. You just have to know that it's in there. Man, I'm telling you, the Bible is a wonderful book. Glory to God forever. Everything you'll ever need is in there. All right, now you, you need to change your knowledge. And how do you change your knowledge? You, well, you read this book. Faith cometh to you by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Read the book and actually believe what you read. See, read the book and believe what you read. Read the book and believe what you read. Read the book and believe what you read. Well, Jesus said over in the book of Matthew. Go teach all nations to observe all the things I've commanded you. In other words, all the things I've said to you, teach all nations to observe that and respect that. And if you'll do it, I will go with you and I will be with you to the last day of your very life. And he will too. You better watch yourself. You can't lose respect for what Jesus says. I'm warning you. You can't never lose respect for what Jesus says. Well, Jesus said in my name, if you believe in me, cast out devils. So don't ever be ashamed as long as you live and say in Jesus' name, come out! You devil in Jesus' name, go from that person. There's only two ways in the Bible that Jesus cast out devils. That's in Jesus. He says, go from this person. And he said to the devil, come out of this person. And there's only two ways. Now, people will tell you all kinds of things, dear God in heaven. I mean, here some time ago, a few years ago, there's a doctor who started across the earth that they come in churches, you know, and pass out bags. Pass out bags and cough devils up. Oh, you talk about sicko. Pass out bags. You don't have no scripture to pass out bags and cough devils up. 
Well, I know it, but uh, there's no scripture, but it works. No, nothing false works. You, oh, you've got to be kidding. No, it don't work, and that, that's because you don't hear of it no more hardly. Now, sometimes, sometimes you will, I mean, sometimes you see manifestations of devils, but I don't, I'm not looking for manifestations of devils. You give devils orders, not manifestations. I'm going to make the devil manifest himself. No, tell the devil what to do. And I've been through all, different, all, nearly all kinds of cases, or different, a lot of different kinds of cases. I was in New York one night, like this, and I'm having an altar call in this real fancy place. And I come to this guy, he was shaking and sweating all over. Sweat popped out on him, and he was like this. <laughs> a very nice looking, distinguished looking man. And I come up and says, what do you want from the Lord? I said, sir, what do you want from God tonight? He said, well, when you speak, it scares me half to death. I said, why does it scare you when I speak? Well, he said, because, he said, uh, he said, I'm, I'm a Baptist minister and I'm, I'm inclined to be a homosexual. I've, I, I got those homosexual tendencies. I said, well, you're not going to have them long. In Jesus' name, cut out of him! Well, make them dumb tendencies leave him. And when I did that, he opened up his mouth. And something flew out of his mouth, spread it out like a water hose, you know. I mean, he shot out his mouth like this, and, he, and it went all over the floor. It looked like sawdust with glue in it. And he fell in it. And he fell like he was dead, right in the middle of it. And I said, in Jesus' name, come out of him! Every time I'd say that, about two or three mouthfuls would go, wow. And this was in, this was in a Presbyterian church. Two pulpits, a real historical type of church, two pulpits and a beautiful wine rug. And I'd say, in Jesus' name, come out! In Jesus' name, come out! Wow. They finally went and got a bucket. Started dipping this stuff up. Then after a while, I said it a few times, and that stuff. And, and all of a sudden, I said, now, Lord, bless this man. And the glory of God came upon him. The glory of the Lord came upon him. And he cried, and he laughed, and he rolled the floor, and he laughed. He started rolling the floor, just like this. And he was laughing. He could, did you ever see a person couldn't stop laughing? I mean, like two or three hours of laughing. Haul him home in a pickup truck, and he's still laughing. And he just kept on and 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 on. Well, that's the joy of the Lord. But when the devil leaves, God, God's full of joy. God's full of joy and full of peace. you walking around, you don't know who you are. I think sometimes I like boys. Well, I think sometimes I like girls. You know, I, I, that's called funny folks. They don't know what they are. Have made up their mind, they have made up their mind what they want to be yet. You know, so they, they, you, you get all, when you don't know who you are, you get all confused. Well, I am telling you that Jesus come to set the confused free and get your thinking straightened out. Blessed be God forever. Get your total thinking straightened out. Blessed be the name of the Lord God forever. Increase your knowledge in Him. Then number three, you've got to come to a place that you're not ashamed to use Jesus' name and openly with the thought, resist the devil. Put down number three, resist. Resist. I must come to a place that I'm not ashamed of Jesus' name and I must resist the devil. Now, that deceives, that, 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 it don't deceive me, but it deceives part of you because the devil has tricked you so much now. He, he's played so many tricks on you in your life, you don't know if it's God or the devil. You have to know if it's God or the devil. And I always remember this, if, there's something, if it's wrong, something wrong with you, it's the devil. You understand that? It's the devil. Just know that. Anything that's wrong with you is the devil. If the pocketbook is empty, it's the devil. I've got 12 businesses, people. I mean, you know, you've got to be kidding. I got one business last month. I've got one business last month that made 8000 I've got another business last month that made 10000 And I made 60 thousand on one real estate deal. And I've got other businesses that made money. And, and I had a man sit in my office the other day. I mean, in my house the other day in Crystal River, Florida. He said, I'm a Presbyterian fellow. I've been listening to your tapes. And I've got spiritual knocked on my door. And he just knocked on my door and said, I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Hayes. He says, but I've got four buyers that wants to buy your property here in Crystal River, Florida. 
Because I know you own a, lot, own a lot of property here, but you've got one piece of five acres. I paid $90,000 for it myself. But the Holy Ghost at daylight, at daylight, come upon me and told me to buy it. So I bought it for $90,000. Now, here's a Presbyterian real estate man sitting in my office, let me sitting in my house, begging me. Now, he's begging me. He says, I can get you a million and a half cash profit right now. Right now, I mean, right now. He says, why don't you let me, this is not counting the real estate fee. He says, I'll get you a million and a half cash for yourself. You, make, you got one business you made 10000 off of. You got one business you made 8000 off of. And made 60 thousand on a real estate deal. And now then you got a guy sitting in your house all at one time, you know, asking you to take a million and a half cash profit. Cash. million and a half. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the result of this. I walk the floor and call myself successful in Jesus' name. I spend hours walking the floor calling myself successful. I am successful in Jesus' name. The devil hates the word success. As long as he can keep you wondering, then he'll keep you in limbo. He hates the word success. That's the reason I get to the word success. I thank you, Lord, because I am successful! And I pray, Lord, that thousands of dollars, and I claim thousands of dollars to come in every week, every month, and to pay all of my bills with, and thousands of dollars left over to spread the gospel with, and buy me what I want. Stupid people say hundreds. <laughs> Dumb people don't say anything. They just kind of float around, float in church, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and whatever happens, happens. And I love the Lord, Brother Noble. And I say, well, so does bluebirds. What's that got to do with it? I said, you have to obey Jesus. You can't just walk around floating around saying, I love the Lord. And you don't have to have money to have a good relationship with God. It's just a side benefit for you. You don't have to be healthy to have a good relationship with God. It's a side benefit for you. The main course is the cross, my brother and sister. The main course is you being saved, being born again by the Spirit of God, and having a sweet relationship with God. That's the main course. But dear God in heaven, God's got so many side courses, you know. You have to keep your mind going all the time to keep up with Him. He wants to bless you so much. Bless you. Now, I'll open up the windows of heaven and bless you that you can't stand it. Sometimes I say now to myself, I said, Dear God, what a, Lord, what am I going to do with all these blessings that's falling on me? He said, well, you're going to help me or I'm going to take them away from you. I said, that's the way it is. He said, that's the way it is. I'll read you one scripture so Charles can get to you. And uh, I'll read you one scripture here now. And I'll finish this up tomorrow. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Now, I gave you three reasons. You've got to come to a place, first of all, so you submit yourself to God. Then you've got to increase your knowledge. Then you, you, you can't be ashamed to resist. Number three is to resist the devil. What do you mean resist the devil? Resist anything that's unsuccessful in your life. Anything that's wrong. Anything unsuccessful, that is the devil, my brother and sister. Hadn't you heard? Anything in your life that's not successful is the devil. Some people say this to me, says, when I, tell them, I tell them, no, I don't see a devil behind every bush. I see four or five devils behind every bush. And I tell people sometimes, I'll tell you today if you want me to, you know where the devil is at? And they say, no, where's the devil at? He is in every spot of your life that's not successful. That's where he's at. That's where he's working. But you don't know he's working there. Some of you don't. Some of you do know it. But see, he's a thief. Jesus said you can't believe nothing he says or nothing he does. He always come to steal, kill, and to destroy but the devil don't ever want you to recognize him. He wants to operate just over in the natural. Well, you just got sick. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Some people get sick, you know, and some don't. Some people are broken, some are not. And just operate in the natural all the time. And if you float along with the natural, you will never even recognize The devil can bombard you for 20 years, and you won't even know it's the devil. Right. Especially if you go to no cold church all the time. They don't even recognize devils. You have to read the Bible, my brother and sister, to recognize devils. Read the Bible. Find out about heaven. What's heaven have? What's God promised you? Is it God's will for you to be healed? Learn to resist the devil, but you're not going to resist the devil. I can tell you right now, you're not going to resist the devil. 
You won't go in your business and pay the I go, I go in my business and pay the price. I bind up devils in Jesus' name and call them successful. I call them successful. I can feel something about coming to my body that's not normal. I say, no, you don't. No, you don't. I won't accept that. I resist that in Jesus' name. I resist that. Go from me. Oh, go. If you don't, just hang around, man. Devils, devils will lay down on your chest. They'll have lunch with you. Man, they'll tell you, go get me a cheeseburger and french fries. You'll be waiting on them. You'll obey, o- obey them all the time. You'll be petting. Oh, well, I know my knee. He's been out of place. I feel better. Feel better. And your friends come over and pat you on the knee and say, How is your knee? Well, it's not doing very good. Oh, well, the Lord is in the knee. When you ought to said, Lay your hands on there and make the devil leave it. Lay your hands on there and make the devil leave it. And if they go, well, now, okay, Lord, if it's thy will, heal me. No, don't pray like that. It'll get worse. Make the devil obey you. Devils are crazy. They'll drive you nuts if you listen to them. Unsuccessful and everything else. But you're not going to ever, the third but not third but not gave you, you're not going to ever resist the devil to any degree unless you obey this right here. Get the spirit of authority in you. Then, he, then Jesus called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Who gave it to you? Jesus did. Who's in you? Spirit of God is in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You say, well, <laughs> Brother Norval, I don't never resist devils and I don't never catch that devils. Or I don't ever do this. Well, look up here at me now for a second. Why don't you recognize that Jesus is not a liar. And he says, the one that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saved and I have the Holy Spirit. But now, wait a minute. Jesus said that first scripture over in Matthew that I read to you, remember that? He said, go teaching men to observe and respect everything I've said. And he said in the book of Mark, I told you, in my name they shall cast out devils. Then Paul comes along and says, well, I know you've got the Holy Spirit in you, but stir up the gift that's in you. Stir up the gift that's in you. Tell God, say, I want authority. God, I want authority. God, I want authority. Stir up the gift that's in you. Stir up the Holy Ghost that's in you. I want authority. I want authority. I want authority. I want authority so I won't be ashamed. I want the spirit of authority in me. And when you get to, I'm, I'm telling you now, when you get the spirit of authority in you, it's staying in you 24 hours a day, you come upon the devil, you'll say, in Jesus' name, come out! I resist you, Satan, in Jesus' name. I talk to heads of my businesses. And they tell me, he says, well, the motel only half filled up, one of your motels only half filled up last night. I say, no, I bind that now. now. Now start praying. Start praying. You agree with me. We'll pray right now over the phone. I bind that half filled motel in Jesus' name. I command cars to pull in here and stop and leave their money. Lots of it. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Do you understand that? But the first thing you must learn and I'll pick up tomorrow Well, left off today, but the first thing that you must learn, what the disciples did when they saw him, they submit. Everybody say submit. submit. So you must submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Not just go around resisting devils. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to your pastor. Submit yourself to church. Learn to tithe. Learn to bless others all the time, all the time. Make it a way of living all the time, all the time, all the time. And the blessing of God will catch up with you. So now let's submit while Charles comes, whoever's going to come now. Let's submit ourselves to God. Turn your little face toward heaven. Lift up your hands and begin to worship Him. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, you may be seated. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to continue on today when I started yesterday. Of course, if you've been around me very long, you know I could continue on that way for a month. You know, it's like the Bible. You never get through. It never runs out. It just keeps on. From blessing to blessing, from mountaintop to mountaintop, blessed be God forever. I went to Bob Tilton's one time about two or three years ago, you know, to speak four nights on a national sideline on the gifts of the Spirit. And I wound up staying, speaking 54 nights. 
And I spoke 54 nights in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians and never did get finished. <laughs> Glory to God forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me, please, <clears throat> where I left off yesterday. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. The book of Luke chapter 9. Yesterday, as if you were not here, I spoke on the subject, how can I make devils leave me? How can I make devils leave me? That was the title of it. And today I will get on into more of exactly how to do that. And I will get into something today that a lot of you don't know anything about. Because you don't pay the price. So you have to pay the price. Anybody that pays the price, you can know what victory is. But you've got to pay the price. Some things you do, you know, some things you get God to do real easy, and some things you can't. Some things the devil will obey you real easy, and some things he won't obey you so easy. But the devil's been a lot, living a long time, he don't want to remove himself from, the, from those premises. Or where he is doing a human being great damage and doing his work. See, the devil's work is to kill, steal, and to destroy, Jesus said. That's all he thinks about. Is destroying your marriage, destroying your business, stealing your money from you, robbing you from joy. He's a total thief. And he wants to rob you everything that God has for you. The devil wants to take it away from you. But he don't want you to know it's the devil doing it. See, if you study the Bible, you'll find out that the devil is a great, he's a professional deceiver. So when you're dealing with the devil, you're not dealing with an amateur. You're dealing with a professional. Now, he's a professional deceiver. He wants to de deceive you. But he don't want you to ever become spiritual enough to know it's the devil. He just wants you to think that devils are on the outside of pepper bottles with horns and a pitchfork. And ugly, you know. You know, Halloween kind. <clears throat> well, that's not the devil. The devil appears as a professional power. Listen closely. As a professional power that even seems right. To your natural makeup. It don't even seem wrong. But it is wrong. When God says something wrong, it's wrong. The, the, there's all kinds of demons in the world and all kinds of devils to deceive and destroy the human race. Now, the demon of lust is that way. The demon of lust is a professional power that will make you think that it's okay to do that at the moment and at the right time. It won't seem like it's wrong. But you do it, and brother, it won't be long, just a few hours, and you'll, <laughs> you'll find out real quick like that you are in trouble with God. Now, how do you find out you're in trouble with God? Well, you find out you're in trouble with God because when your mind begins to be a little confused. And you feel like on the inside of you that you're about a half dead and cold. And indifferent towards God. And there's some kind of power that got in your mind that you you don't have you don't have any eagerness no more in you to go to church. You don't have any eagerness no more in your mind, your mind, your mind can't even make the decision to get on your knees and worship God. Because you don't think that way anymore. And obeying lust one time will cause you to become that kind of a creature. 
You understand me? You want to have it. So you've been, you say, what's happened to me? You've been separated from God. When you commit sin, whether you know it or not, when you commit sin, God pulls a veil between you and Him. You have no more clear channel to the throne of God. There's a veil pulled between you and Him. And you can't even find God. And your mind don't feel that much about finding. And sometimes you'll try to repent and you can't get nowhere. It all depends on how you did it. But if you'll repent anyway, just repent anyway, just fall on your knees and repent anyway, once you recognize you've done something wrong, repent anyway and ask the Lord to forgive you and accept it by faith. And if you'd ever learn to keep, keep the condemnation out of you and accept forgiveness by faith and start working your way towards God and just keep on worshiping God even though you may feel as cold and dead and dry as anything. Just make yourself fall on your knees and worship God. Make yourself tell Jesus you love Him. Make yourself go to church. Make yourself do it. Make yourself plow your way back to God. Make yourself. Because if you don't do it, if you don't make yourself, then you'll wind up doing that same lust again. You say you won't, but you will. And you will. And you will. It'll be just, it won't be any different. It'll be just exactly like Jimmy Swagger. Jimmy says, I've asked myself the question 10,000 times. Why would a man like me do that? I mean, 10,000 times I've asked myself that question. Well, you do it on account of the demon of lust. That's all. Demon of lust in the flesh. And uh, so there's all kind of weird demons of lust, as you know. I have worked with homosexuals and dope addicts and street people and in the penitentiaries and prostitutes and stuff for years, trying to get them free from the devil's power. And I know I was holding a youth meeting one time at the Hot Regency Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. And they gave me a room with no chairs in it, just a room with a carpet. But I like those kind of rooms for a youth meeting. Just have them all set on the floor. And Skeeter Davis and Connie Smith and Lulu and people was there that night. So I went in and got Connie Smith, you know, and I says, Connie, I said, honey, come in here. I said, I'm the youth director. I'm in charge of all the youth. And I said, I've got a room full of kids in here sitting in the middle of the floor. I said, come in here, come in here and say a few words to them about Jesus. I said, can you, can you? I said, I don't have any stuff set for tapes. I said, can you sing a song a cappella? She said, oh, yeah. I said, well, come in here. Just to, she said, okay. So she followed me in there and I told the kids who she was. You know, she was a grand old opera star. And everything you know, but she got saved several years ago. So she took the microphone. And, she, and Connie started singing a song about Jesus, you know. No music or nothing. She started singing a song about Jesus. And in the second verse, she sung, The power of God fell in the place. Glory to God. And the kids all over the floor started crying and weeping. The Spirit of God came up on Connie. And she was weeping and singing all at the same time. And dear God, I mean, telling you right now, we had, it was wonderful. And the Spirit of God was working so strong and I was getting blessed myself. I always try to get it on it. I want all the blessings I can get. Hey, if you sing, I may ask you sometimes, sing me a song. I want to get blessed. And if you're anointed of God, I want you anointed to flow into me. I want all the God I can get. Any time I can get Him. Blessed be God forever. I'll take Jesus for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day the rest of my life. Jesus is one person that you don't never get tired of. 
He said, Brother Norval, I've been coming to this convention now for four days, and I'm wore out like a rag. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm trying to attend three services a day, and I'm just all... <laughs> well, I'm not talking about services and conventions. I'm talking about Jesus, you know. You let Jesus touch you at every service, and you won't ever get tired. Glory to God forever. Never get tired. Because there's something fresh about him that flows from God all the time. And all of a sudden, two girls that worked with me in my ministry come to the door and says, Brother Norfolk, come here, come here, come here. And I went to the door and says, Norfolk, there's a prostitute out here standing outside the nightclub here in the Hot Regency. And said, we witnessed to her. And we want you to, we want you to talk to her. So I went out, and this tall blonde was standing there with long black pants on, short jacket, you know, real sharp-looking girl. And so I just walked up to her and began to witness to her. And what got her was on his testimony. And I said, well, honey, don't make a difference to you. I've been working with all kinds of people for years. And I said, my daughter was on drugs for three years, and I couldn't get her to quit either. Nobody else couldn't get her. Kenneth Haggard couldn't get her to quit. Lester Summerall couldn't get her to quit, and I couldn't get her to quit. The church couldn't get her to quit. Nobody could. And I said, one night, Jesus sent an angel into her room about as big as two men, and it scared all the dope devils out of her. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> what a <it> did. <laughs> and she was sitting in church. She don't like to stand up, but I ought to make her just because she don't like to. <laughs> She's trying to write, so I won't notice her. But I'm proud because she's free. So when I told this prostitute that God sent an angel into my daughter's room, set her free, and I says, the same Jesus that set her free will set you free. And she looked at me. Now, she hadn't said a word. She looked at me just as straight and says, What is an angel? I said, an angel is a creature sent from heaven with orders from God to do a work, and they go on missions for God, directly from the Lord, and they love people, and they come to help people. And the moment I said that, God hit her right in front of me. And she broke and started crying, this prostitute did, and she couldn't stand it, and she was gapping for breath, <laughs> and took off running away from me down the hallway just like a wild woman. And she ran in the bathroom, ladies' bathroom. And I said to these two girls, I says, go get her. <laughs> go put your arms on her and tell her you love her. I says, go talk to her. So they went in there, tried to talk to her and so forth, and she's in there trying to hold on to the walls, crying and crying and crying. And so they talked to her for a while and talked to her for a while, and she finally agreed, you know, she says, well, I'll... okay, she says, I'll go back out. I'll go back out if, if you let me talk to that same man I was talking to. She said, something happened to me when he was talking to me. Something happens to everybody I talk to. <laughs> if you stay here very long, something will happen to you. Glory to God forever. I take backslidden ministers with me all the time. And you say, well, uh, maybe you ought to take Jimmy with you. Well, I'll take him and anybody else. I could take Jimmy Sager with me for two weeks. I'll guarantee you I could take him with me for two weeks and set him totally free and he'd be free forever and he would learn how to resist devils and be free forever. So when them devils told him to put on a sweatshirt and a ball cap and sunshades and drive to New Orleans, he'd say, I resist you, you flaky thing. I bind you. <laughs> but if you don't know what to do, you know, and if you belong to a denomination that believe that Christians can't have a devil, well, then it's just, you know, that you, you just obey devils. Because, you know, you've been told all your life that Christians can't have a devil. Why, you know, you know what? You know, you know devils won't bother Christians. Honey, I got news for your squirrely mind. I got news for your mind. You are the prime target. You're the one the devil's after. 
Watch the the devil's been after sinners. They already got them. They're after you. They're going to do everything they can to get you to backslide everything they possibly can. They'll put all kinds of squirrely ideas in your mind. In fact, if you want to know the truth about it, the whole human race is so squirrely, including you, that you would not want the whole world to see every little thing that you've done in your bedroom, in your bathroom, in your private. What if the world saw everything that you did from the time you were born to right now? (laughs) Jimmy Swagger would probably have wings. He said, oh, no, my God, my God, no, dear Lord, no. Well, see, God knows all about it, but if you've been forgiven, he's forgot all the dumb mess. Well, the human beings are flaky. What's my new book? What's my new book when the bees on it? Flakes don't flourish. Oh, I've really got some good stuff. My last book was my my last book come out the title that you can see it on my table out there is Prostitute Faith. Then I'm my next book I think is going to be Flakes Don't Flourish. Then I'm going to write one where I, I'm going to write one to teach Christians how to hate. That'll really go over in the church. <laughs> this book will teach you how to hate. Oh, really? Well, tell me about it. Let's always remember this. Until you come to a place that you hate what the devil is doing to you, you will never change. You will never change. I mean, I love, I've, I've loved Jimmy for years, but a psychologist and some going through some course for 12 months, that's not going to ever help him any. I mean, you'll be them same devils and he gets out will be just as big as they were before. They'll tell him next time to get two ball caps. In fact, the devil will buy him a whole box full of sweatshirts. Yeah, and send him a whole class of, a whole case of sunshades. Always, always remember this. Anything the devil has ever done to you, Jimmy Swaggart, Norval Hayes, Billy Graham, or your pastor, or anybody else, anything the devil has ever done to you, Paul said... Uh, he will come back again and try to do the same thing. All he had to do, you said, well, bless God, he's not going to come back to me because I love the Lord. Well, fish love the Lord. Bluebirds love the Lord. You said, well, he doesn't do anything to me because I go to church all the time. So does little mouses go to church all the time. Don't make much difference because you go to church all the time. You're going to have to have something more than, I love the Lord and I go to church. You're going to have to have more than that, honey. You're going to have to know the power there is in Jesus' name, and you're going to have to know your responsibility on taking authority over the devil. And all these things that messes the human race up and messes anybody up is totally the devil. The devil, I don't have no devils. If there's anything wrong with you, you do. What do you mean I do? I don't have devils. Well, they're following you around, robbing you. What do you let devils rob you for? Well, I don't have no devils. I'll admit that I'm broke and sick and my mind's a little confused, but I don't have no devils. (laughs) What do you have then? (laughs) I don't know, but I don't have devils. Well, Jesus said, if you have me and believe me and trust me, Jesus said, I'll give you abundant life. You can have have everything you want. Now, I'm going to teach you this afternoon how to get anything you want. And I'm going to teach you how to do it. Blessed be God forever. But you're going to have to learn to come against the devil. The devils are crazy, man. They're nuts. They'll rob and steal from you the rest of your life. And if you don't recognize it's the devil, if you don't recognize it's the devil, I've got news for you, boy. You're in trouble. You are in bad trouble. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The devil is such a liar and such a thief, and he will rob and steal you. 
So that pretty prostitute, she came back out of that bathroom and come back up there, you know. And she came back up there to me and she says, walked up with these two girls that worked for me and from my ministry. And she said, and they said, Brother Norval said, this girl, was, she said, she said, she'll just talk to you and nobody else. And I said, well, she don't need to talk to nobody else. Glory to God forever. You just have to know that. You have to know you have authority and power over devils. Now we're standing for the nightclub out in the hallway at Nashville, Tennessee, at the Hot Regency Hotel. And she says, I said, you want to talk to me? And she said, yes, sir. You agreed to talk to me? And she said, yes, sir. I said, all right. Now look at me, honey. God's dealing with you, and I know he is. Look at me. Now tell me the truth. From way down deep inside of you, I want you to tell me the truth. I said, do you like being a prostitute? And she says, no, I hate it. She said, the only thing I like about it is the money. She said, I make four or five hundred dollars a night. A lot of guys give me a hundred dollars. And I said, well, you're a sharp girl. I said, I can see that. Some guy didn't know what he was doing, that's fine. But now you don't want to be a prostitute, is that right? She says, no, no, I don't want to be. I only do it for the money. And I said, well, you don't have to be one. Just come right over here, honey. Stand in the hallway, come right over here. I said, stand right here against this wall in Jesus' name. I said, now I want to pray for you. And I'm going to make that power leave you that's caused you to be a prostitute. You understand that? She says, yeah. In Jesus' name. And I laid my hands up on her like this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I command you, you demon of lust. I command you to obey me in Jesus' name. Come out of her! And the moment I said that, she broke, began to cry. And I said it four or five more times real strong. In Jesus' name. Come out of her, I said. Leave her alone. And she's standing there against the wall, just a sobbing. And every time I would say it, she'd get more freedom. And she's sliding down the wall, you know, about to melt the floor. And all of a sudden, here comes this real sharp guy along, you know, Reverend Sharp, Assembly of God pastor from Las Vegas, Nevada, who had a million, who had the gold dome across the street from the uh, MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, that round dome auditorium there. He was the pastor of it. He passed by just as I was casting the devil out of her. He stopped and watched me cast the devil out of this prostitute. In the church, when I got through, he walked up to me and said, My name is Reverend Sharp. I'm a pastor of a million dollar church in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Las Vegas, Nevada. He said, I want to get you to come to my church. I said, Oh, why not? <laughs> so I wound up going, stayed, stayed, stayed a few days and taught for him. But I set her totally free. I mean, the Holy Spirit blessed her, my God. Well, why did the Holy Spirit start working her so, so easy for her? Because she was hungry. She didn't want to be one. If you want to be what you are, if you want to be what the devil has made you, or if you want to let the devil keep on robbing you and stealing from you, well, God can help you. But if you get sick and tired of being sick in your body, you get sick and tired of being broke, you get sick and tired of what the devil is doing for you, Hey, I got news for you. If you find somebody with authority that'll talk to you and pray for you, Jesus will set you totally free. From anything. Get that straight. From anything. You get set free from anything. You may have a crooked limb in here today. Well, you can get it to be made straight. You just have to have. Now I'm coming to the part that you're going to need today. You have to know and understand what determined faith is and what makes it work. You understand that? All right, now if you're taking notes, take, get your paper out. So you can get these two or three or four things down that will stick with you for the rest of your life and don't lose the note because if you do, if you lose what I'm telling you today and lose your notes, then in two or three or four weeks you'll go back, back in the old lap of religion which is a part of you may be living in now. And always remember, every part of your life is not successful. You, you, you're, just, you're just laying around and wallowing around in the lap of religion with no victory. Well, God wants you to get out of men's doctrines and religion and start getting over into Jesus and start getting victory. Victory. Everybody say, victory! victory. 
And brother, when you say victory, tell the devil, victory, and I mean, say it like you mean it. Say victory. Victory. Always remember this, congregation. That's the only thing that God has anything to do with. You understand that? You're not serving a God that wallows around in defeat. You may be defeated yourself, but God don't have anything to do with it. That's the decision that you've made yourself. And of course you make decisions, you know. You make decisions because of your knowledge. The decisions that you make today is sitting there in the seat is because of the knowledge of somebody that's taught you about God in the past. Well, did you ever stop and think maybe your past teachers don't know much? If you're living in defeat, either they don't know much or you didn't, you didn't listen to them one. Because in Jesus, you can have victory. And not maybes. There's no maybes in God. In Jesus, you can have victory. But you can't get it unless you have approach it with the right ingredients. You have to have the right ingredients and you have to approach victory with the right kind of quality. Always remember this, honey. God is quality. And I just, well, you, maybe you don't know it, but I just want you to know that you're looking at a first class man that serves a first class God. And I have a first class Bible. And I was, they taught me to read in school. You understand? And so I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm not going to listen to men's doctrines. I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm going to, I'm going to find out what the promises of God is for myself. I'm going to claim it for myself in Jesus' name. And when I claim it for myself, I'm either going to get it or God's a liar. And i got news for you. I've got 25, 26 years' experience with God, and He is not a liar. He will do anything He says He'll do. And the beautiful part about God is He will do it for you. Anything I can get God to do, you can get God to do it. And I can't get God to do everything. But I can get God to do a lot more than I used to get Him to do. The older I get, the better I know God. And, and the better I know Him, the sweeter it gets. And the more victory I get. Glory be to God forevermore. And you might as well make up your mind, and if you listen, you can learn this stuff and get it when you're young. Why don't you wait and get to my age before you have victory? Man, God loves you if you're 18 years old. Give your life to God for the days that I use. And learn who you are in Christ Jesus and learn who Jesus is and have respect for God's Word and you can have anything you want. But you, have to, you, you can't work on victory on a part-time basis. You can't let the world just tear you apart. Blessed be God forever. But the Bible says in Luke 9, 1, Then Jesus called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. My brother and sister, you have power and authority over all devils. And you also have the knowledge, you ought to have the knowledge in Jesus' name to get rid of all diseases. Now yesterday I taught you some of those things, exactly what to do. I can't go back and teach you that lesson again. I mean, I could. But you need to get that tape that I made yesterday and then study it for yourself. It's, you know, remember what I told you yesterday? I just highlighted it. I told you, you're going to, first of all, you have to submit yourself to God. Submit, 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 submit. Half of the human race don't even know what that means. Well, you know, I want to do what I want to do. Well, sure. Go ahead. You flaky thing, you go ahead, do what you want to do. But God won't listen to you. Well, you mean God won't help me? No, He won't. But if you'll do what God says do, He will help you. Not only help you, you'll have victory. You can't do what you want to do. You just have to learn that in God, you can't do what you want to do. Because where God is, there's nothing except victory in heaven. And the house you live in may not have all victory. (laughs) Well, that's the truth, noble. I'll tell you that right now. No victory. Some days I go to work, you know, and these goofy people I work with, you know. And boy, I'm running out like a rag the time I get out of that place. And then on the way home, you know, I run go bumper to bumper traffic, and four or five people blows horns at me and curses. And I get home then, my wife meets me at the door and says, Beat all the kids. <laughs> then you nearly drove me nuts. Then I said, Well, the only thing you need, I said, The only thing you need, I said, Make sure you go to church on Wednesday night. 
you got, if you if you got all that stuff happening to you, I said, make sure you go to church on Wednesday night and go to the altar on Wednesday. Not throw all that stuff over on him that you got Monday and Tuesday. Go back again Sunday morning, throw it over on God. Just throw it over on God. You, you, you can't carry that stuff around with you. Throw it over on God. Be a strong pillar in the church. And Jesus said, if you be a strong pillar in the church, I'll give you a set of keys that fits everything in heaven. Just hunt the right key, the right lock, and unlock it. And God said, come in to the throne of God with boldness and take what rightfully belongs to you. Take it away from the devil. What rightfully belongs to me? Victory. Victory belongs to you. I've given you power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, Jesus said. Blessed be God forever. But you're not going to have... The spirit of authority is not going to work in you to any great degree until you learn some things. Learn some things? You have to learn some things. You're going to have to learn it for yourself. I can't learn it for you. You have a mind, so learn it for yourself. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of James. The first chapter of the book of James. Thank you, Jesus. Review. He said review yesterday, please. He missed it. Well, I can do it lightly, you know, but you can buy the tape. <laughs> let me, I, 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 I will try to do it the best I can. But let me get this book of James and what this, what this thought is on me right now. Because you're not going to ever use authority. You're not going to ever use authority in Jesus' name like you're supposed to against the devil. And against defeat and against diseases and against your empty pocketbook. And against your mind that's not enjoying peace and joy and joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You need to keep joy. You need to keep, learn how to keep joy all the time. Because if you don't, you lose your strength. Don't lose your strength, my brother and sister. If you lose your strength, always remember this. The devil, if you lose your strength, you're a first class target for the devil. Weak people are the devil's prey. Unless the devil can find a weak spot in you, he can't even bother you. He cannot do anything to you at all unless the devil finds a weak spot. He has to find a weak spot. But I got news for you. Jimmy Swagger is probably just as good a man as there is in this building, or women too. He, the devil found his weak spot. Well, I got news for you. We've all got weak spots. You understand that? I mean, there's a certain area of your life that may not be too hot. I mean, your temper might flare up. <laughs> I used to have a ruthless temper until I found out about the Holy Ghost. I used to have a ruthless temper until I found out about the fire of God. And do you know, there's a lot of Pentecostal people I found out don't know very much about the fire of God. Oh, John the Baptist said, I mean, he said, I, I'll, I'll baptize you in this water if you'll repent. But that's all I can do for you. But when Jesus comes, he'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost and baptize you with fire. And I wonder what the fire was. And I found out that fire burns. You know, natural fire burns natural things. But the fire he's talking about there, it burns all the chaff in you out. That's what God wants to do is get all the junk in you out. And I found out years ago, when I got rid of temper, I found out years ago, if I just go before God and take authority over temper in Jesus' name by faith, and, and, and just start praying in the Holy Ghost, and just pray in tongues, just get me, get in the sanctuary by myself, or get in my room by myself, or living by myself, and just keep on praying. Pray for two or three or four hours. Just pray out loud in the Spirit. Blessed be God forever. It won't be very long. And every once in a while, stop in English and say, Temper, I bind you and I command you, go from me. I want, I want the love and the patience of God. I bind you, spirit of temper, you demon of temper that tries to drive me. Go from me in Jesus' name. I want the kind of peace and patience. If a house is burning down, I can look at it and say, is that right? Rather than go nuts. I don't mind to carry water to help put it out. I don't want it to drive me crazy. You're going to learn this afternoon, not let conditions of the world drive you crazy. Because if you do, you'll always be wanting things. But you never get them. Notice the first chapter of the book of James. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. 
My brethren, James says to the church, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Now, Brother Noah, well, I don't know if I believe that or not, because, you know, when I fall into divers' temptations, the devil gets after me, and he's running after me, and trying to get me to do things, he won't leave me alone, he won't leave me alone, he won't leave me alone. It's, that's not joy to me. You know, it drives me nuts, it's not joy to me. Paul, James says, count it all joy. Paul said, stir up the gift that's in you. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. That means you ought to have the spirit of authority in you to learn how to resist the devil. When you resist him, he can't do anything to you. That is if you have an ingredient that you need to have within your being, within your own human spirit. And James tells you exactly what it is right here. Blessed be God forever. Notice verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Everybody say patience. Now that's exactly what you need to deal with devils, is patience. You need to have authority and patience to deal with some devils. Now little old weak devils, I mean little old weak devils, it didn't take a lot of patience to be with that prostitute. Because I just bind Jesus' name. Come out of her! Because while I was talking to her to begin, I'd been talking to her for about a minute, and God's power hit her, and I knew when the Holy Spirit got through with her, she hated. See, she hated being a prostitute. If you're doing something like that and you hate it, you hate it, you hate it, you hate it, God is going to send somebody across your path so you can get rid of it. And you may not be able to get rid of it yourself, but God will send somebody across your path. Now, as long as you like sin... And as long as you enjoy it, and as long as you want to do it, and you have no intention of changing, then God will just leave you alone. That unless, unless your grandmother prays a lot. <laughs> if your grandmother and mother prays a lot, and they spend hours of praying, and they pray that you don't have a good time, then you'll be miserable in the middle of all of it. <laughs> but if nobody prays for you, you can find a certain amount of joy in the sin. But if somebody's praying for you all the time, like your mother, well... Let me say you get a lot of heartaches and trouble and knots on your head and scars. If you do have a human being filled with the Spirit and they're laying before God praying for you a lot, if your mother or your grandmother, you have somebody praying for you an awful lot, uh, give up. (laughs) Because you don't have any chance. You might as well forget it. You don't have no chance to be happy. You might as well give up and find the nearest church you can find and go out and fall in front of the pulpit and say, God, here I am. Because you're just going to live a life of just totally defeat. And you won't have a good time. You won't. Blessed be God forever. You won't have a good time. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Well, you need to get patience in your spirit, my brother and sister. Patience. Everybody say patience again. You've got to get patience in your spirit. Get the foundation of your life grounded on the book of Hebrews and learn what faith is from the book of Hebrews. Knowing that your faith is your substance before you ever see it. Your faith is your substance before you ever see it. Your faith is your answer before you ever see it. Know that God is truth and He's not a lie and He will give you total victory in anything before you ever see it. You just have to learn not to waver. Keep all doubt out of you. Keep the doubt out of you. Doubt will rob you. Doubt will damn your life with God. It will totally damn you. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Did I see you, Jimmy? Praise the Lord. I don't know. My daughter used to be a fan of yours. Jimmy Clinton used to be a rock and roll star and, you know, screaming teenagers and all that, you know. He's been through all of it. But now he loves the Lord and sings for the Lord. Stand up, Jimmy, so it's only going to see you. Stand up. There she is. (laughs) Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Isn't it wonderful to see God, you know, just... Take people who used to do their own thing, sit sitting in church with the Bible, listen to God's Word. I'm telling you, it's wonderful, isn't it? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jimmy's got a new life now. You wouldn't go back to the old life for nothing, would you, Jimmy? 
No, dear God, no, me either. Lord Jesus, deliver me from Broadway stage plays and operas, country clubs and dirty jokes. Oh, God. When you have to live that kind of a life, you say, that sounds pretty exciting to me. Oh, it is for a few years and you don't have any sense. <laughs> but after a while, when you get to thinking about death, and you know someday you're going to have to take your last breath. Oh, I'll never forget. In my 20s, I'd worked myself up to being an executive. But I never made big money like Jimmy probably, but I, just made, I was making about 5000 a week. Four Cadillacs in my driveway and everything I wanted, you know, 25 years ago. I turn a light out at night and I get to thinking, Jimmy. I got four Cadillacs sitting out front. Everything I paid for. Safety to deposit boxes full of money. What if I died today? Where would I go to? The only thing I've been doing is trying to build my own career. Fighting, clawing, making money to the top. And here I am now. I've been voted to the top seat of the corporation. I've been voted into the executive board. I mean, you just can't go any further unless you just buy the place. I find I just bought it. <laughs> but here I am now. You work your way up to the ladder. And you've arrived and you don't have anything if you arrive. No security. But brother, when you've got Jesus inside of you and you believe what the Bible is saying, you've got security. I'm telling you that you can get anything. You know how to get anything. If your faith has patience, you can get anything from God. God will do anything for you. Oh, really? And you'll wind up with whatever you want if you'll have patience in your faith. See, God does not answer nervous prayers. And devils pay no attention to nervous faith. Because they know, always remember this, devils know after a while that nervous faith will give up. And devils know they don't have to listen to nervous faith and nervous authority and not knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. But notice verse 5. I mean, verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wanting nothing. What do you mean, wanting nothing? No, when your, peace, when your spirit and your faith starts to have patience, you'll wind up having everything. And your confidence will be in Jesus' name and the Word of God, and you get what you want. And you help other people too. Real quick, like, as I close down. Real quick, like, this afternoon. I want to give you an example. And always remember, God can only give you orders and send you places and send you certain spots on the level of your faith and on the level of your patience. If you don't have it, then God will always use you with shallow people and just shallow stuff in the gospel. That's all He'll ever do. He can never send you to no hard cases. Because you don't have it, why would He send you? You're about as defeated as they are. Why would He send you? I'm in a shopping center one day in my hometown, sitting in my car, and all of a sudden, glory to God forever, and all of a sudden, late in one afternoon, the Spirit of God come up on me, sitting in the car, and revelation knowledge come to me. I broke and began to cry and weep, sitting in the car, and God began to give me revelation knowledge. Showed me an address and a place He wanted me to go to at Chattanooga, Tennessee, and didn't tell me why He wanted me to go. I always remember this. A lot of times, God won't tell you why He wants you to do anything. He just wants you to do it. He just wants you to see if you love Him enough to obey Him. But always remember, after you get there, He'll show you why you're there. I mean, He's not a dummy, you know. He'll show you why you're there. So I go to this certain address in Chattanooga and pull my car up in this winding driveway. What address to go to? And I, I went there, and a person come running out of the house, saw my car. They, they, they knew my car. Come out of the house. There's a demon possessed person inside. You know what the person said? Come out and jerk my car door open. I didn't even get out of the car. I just drove up. And somebody saw my car driving up this winding driveway. And they come running out of the house. There was a person in there that knew me. The person says, God sent you here. God sent you here. There's a demon possessed person on the inside of the house. God sent you here. I said, it sounds like he might have. I said, yeah, I know he sent me here. He told me to come here right now. 
As the staff minister in Cleveland, Tennessee, and he told me to come here right now. Go now. And so I took off. And I went in there. And this man walked up to me, a very distinguished looking man. He says, I am Dr. So-and-so from Covington College on the top of Lookout Mountain. And he said, uh, I have a demon-possessed boy here, one of our college students. He began to streak here so four, four or five days ago across the campus in the nude. That was the days of the streaking and raiding girls' dormitories. See how many pairs of girls' panties you could find. And they'd raid the dormitories to streak. And he said he was streaking, and his mind snapped, and he's been... The idiot ever since then. He don't even know his own name. He sits around. Uh, 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 uh. He's a padded cell case. He's been like this now for several days. Just sitting there. Don't even know his own name. His, his mind snapped. You better, take this, you, you better take this as a warning. What you do with your body affects your mind. I mean, get this. What you do with your body affects your mind. I've never worked with a mental patient in my life, not one. Not one in all these years. I've never worked with one mental patient that hadn't been doing strange things to their bodies. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's where the Spirit of God lives. You can't do anything you want to. Get involved in all kinds of wild, goofy sex acts and all kinds of goofy things. You can't do it because if you do, you're going to mess yourself up with God. And besides that, you can make God so mad He'll take His hand off of you and turn you over to the devil. So you have to watch what you do. You can't do anything you want to. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. His mind is snapped. This, he's, this fellow said, I'm the psychiatrist. I'm Dr. So-and-so from Covenant College, and I brought him down here. He said, you know, Mr. Hayes, he said, a, a year ago, I didn't even believe in stuff like this. He told me. I said, well, most people don't. It's nothing new to me. He said, but I, I began to read some stuff and hear some stuff. And he says, and, and he says, and, he says, and you know, he said, I saw you on television. He said, I saw an ex-convict on television here a while back. And he said on television that he was, and started down to Florida to get a load of dope. And he parked his car at a certain place. His car fell apart at a certain place. And there was some kind of power said, go in that building right there. And he said, that, that, that guy looked like Charles Manson. He said, I walked in that building, this guy did on television. He says, I walked in there. And he said, I, he, he, said he said, something told me to go in a certain room. And he said, I went in that room. And he said, there was two fellows in there named Norval Hayes and Lester Summerall holding a meeting. He says, and I walked in there. And he says, something said to me, go, walk, walk up front. He said, I walked up front. And he did with black bags tied around his arms like this. He's on the way as far to get a load of dope. And a tooth hanging around his neck. An Indian headband around like this, a sleeveless shirt on, and Indian moccasins. And his beard down there right here, he walked in like this, walked up front. Me and Lester walked over to him. We didn't ask him what he wanted. We walked over to him and said, in Jesus' name, come out of him! And God set him totally free, and he got saved and felt, glory to God. And this college psychologist, I saw that guy on television. And he says, he says, he says, and I want to ask you a question. Would you be willing to pray for this college student? I said, well, I will if you leave me alone. Oh, he says, oh, no, I don't want to leave you alone. He says, I want me and my colleague and my assistant here to go in the room and watch you. I said, oh, no. No, 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 no. He says, we want to help, we want to help you pray for him. I said, no, uh no. I said, well, he said, why? I said, because you don't know what you're doing. I said, if you knew what you're doing, you ought to have him free. He said, he said, oh, you know, None of the whole human race thinks they know what they're doing. You know, everybody thinks they're right. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, if I'm doing it, it's right. Oh, sure. Maybe, maybe most things you do is not right. You ought to ask God sometimes. You ought to judge Him with victory. Is it bringing you victory? Because if it's not victory, God don't have anything to do with it. What do you want with it if it's not victory? Well, I'm kind of wilding around in it and wondering. Well, God don't work in wondering. He works in faith. He works in victory. I said, I will, if you leave me alone. He said, well, where do you want to go? And I said, no, I won't. you pray for him yourself. I won't go in. He said, well, why, normal? Because I don't want two guys sitting in there with me, psychologists who don't even know what they're doing. I want my faith to work. I don't want to overplow their faith. Get them all out of the room. You just have to know this. So I, they said, well, okay. So they turned me loose in the room with him by himself, just me and him. He sat there. Had a spoken, he hadn't even spoke a word in days. Mm, 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 mm. What's your name? Mm, mm, mm. So after I, I closed the door, I walked over to him with patience. With patience! You can never help a person like that unless you got patience. 
I walked over to him. I said, Now Satan, I come against you in Jesus' name. God has sent me here to cast you out. And I bind you in Jesus' name. I have come here to take this boy's mind away from you. I know that you think that you've stole this boy's mind and you're going to keep it forever, but you're not going to. I can tell you that now. i got news for you. You're not going to keep this boy's mind. I've come to get his mind back for him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I bind you and I command you to obey me. Come out of him! In Jesus' name, I break you loose. I reach down deep on the inside of this boy and I pull you out of there. I command you to turn his spirit loose and turn his body loose. Turn his mind loose in Jesus' name. Come out of him! And I did that five or six times real strong. And then I went over. When I got through, I got a little bit tired. And then I went over and had a chair sitting there and I went over and sat down. With patience. <laughs> Always remember, don't let devils drive you crazy. And I went over and sat down with patience and enjoyed myself. Went over and enjoyed myself and sung a song. <laughs> Glory to God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now listen to the closely. And enjoyed myself. Ain't nobody that but me and the devil. And the Lord in me. So I said, enjoy you. Learn to enjoy yourself wherever you go. Don't let life push you around. Learn how to live, my brother and sister. Learn how to live. You understand that? Most human beings are a bit more how to live than a goose in a snowstorm. They have to have all kinds of things and conditions and all kinds of everything to be in life before they enjoy themselves. Are you kidding? I can enjoy myself. Ain't nobody in the room but me and demons. I bind them up and sing a song to God. In Jesus' name. Amazing grace. Stood there for a while and I got rested. And sung a song or two and hummed a few. Walked over to him in Jesus' name. I said, now I told you to turn him loose. And I bind you. I told you to come out of him. You mean you're still in there? Well, you crazy devil. You come out of him, I said. I bind you. Come out. And I kept that up for about 10 or 15 minutes. What did you do? Well, what do you think I did? I just didn't. I got started getting a little bit tired. Not real tired. Just a little bit. I just wanted to let the devil know he don't push me around. I sat back down in the chair. Sung another song. Enjoyed myself. Late in the afternoon, just before dark. Just before dark. You say, how long did you do that? All night. All night long. After a while... That guy gets up from where he's sitting and goes as far from me as he can, way over in the corner, and lays down in the corner just as far from me. It's a great big room. And he lays down on the floor. I mean, lays down on the floor and begin to scream. First word I heard him say is, Water! Water! I want water! 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 I want water! And after he screamed water for a few minutes, and I was over, I didn't let him shake me up. I said, I'm not giving you no water. I'm singing a song to the Lord. He's over in a corner screaming water. After a while, the door flew open, and here come those two guys in like two, like two English butlers carrying water. I said, where are you going? They said, well, we heard him, uh, we heard him asking for water. I said, I don't give devils a drink. You know what they said to me? They said, devils. Now you know why the woman in the room with me? I said, yeah, that's the devil. I said, that's that shrill voice coming out of him screaming, water. I want water. I want water. Water, water, water. I want water. I said, you can't give him water. I said, it won't be long. He'll be ordering a cheeseburger. You don't obey the devil. And they said, Devils, well, we thought, he's, he's a student in our, our school, and we thought he wanted a water. I said, no, the devils want water. I said, you don't obey the devil. Let him do without. I said, don't come back no more. They said, oh, okay, all right. It won't be long. You can't obey the devil, man. He'll do all kinds of things to you. All night long, about daylight the next morning, I'm sitting in a chair, minding my own business, just sitting there now. Taking one of my rest stops. 
All night. Everybody say all night. All night. Uh, that's a long ways from your uh, 20 minute prayers. 20 minute prayers don't have any patience. You understand what I'm saying to you? And so he comes up. I'm sitting on a chair like this. He didn't say another word all night. He comes up in front of me. The same demon possessed boy comes up in front of me and stands like this right here. I'm sitting right there, and he comes up and stands right in front of me and stands there like this. And then he goes. On one foot, he looks like some kind of athletic statue. And I'm just sitting there and I said, oh, well, the demon devil, because the devils are crazy, they'll do anything. I just sat there and said, I bind you, Satan, you turn that boy loose, you give his mind back to him, come out of him, I said. And he stood there, I bet you, for 30 minutes like this. It'd take the devil because I, a human being couldn't do that, I don't think. So, sit there like this. And all of a sudden, I saw his lips begin to part just about a little teeny bit. I saw the end of his tongue come between his lips. I said, in Jesus' name, come out of him. Come out a little bit farther, a little bit farther. And then his mouth began to open. Open about that wide, his mouth did, at the beginning. And I saw a little slob of some kind of funny looking stuff coming out the corner of his mouth like this, each side of his tongue. And I said, in Jesus' name, come out of him. I turned his mind back for him, in Jesus' name. You're not more powerful than God, devil. I bind you. I come to get this boy's mind back to him. God sent me here under directions of the Holy Spirit. And I command you, turn his mind loose. Come out of him. I've been there all night, and the longer I stayed, the louder I got. It's what you call authority. And the devil knows if he thought he ever gets weak. And I told you before, weak people are the devil's prey. Understand that. And he... If he missed his mouth, look up open like this, his tongue sticking out, and some kind of weird looking slava. It wasn't spittled, it was some kind of strange looking slava running out the side of his tongue, and a great big puddle of it in the floor. I mean, a great big puddle of it. And all of a sudden, when that, a great big puddle of that slava run out of him, he snapped to himself, and his mind came back to him that morning. I came back to him real quick. Let me have those. Patience is what gets you victory from the devil. Patience, you understand that? All right. I have a tape series here. This will help you. These will help you. Power and authority over all, all demons. Now put this down. If you want any of these, put these down. This is a different one. I, 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 I didn't mention this yesterday. I missed another one yesterday. Power and authority over all demons. Everybody say, all of them. Ones that drives you crazy, homosexual demons, anything else. All of them. Power and authority over all devils. And all it is, anything I can do, you can do. I'm not, I'm not such a hot shot Christian myself. Anything I can do, you can do. Get that straight. Amen. Get patience in your spirit. Get patience in your faith. And then don't forget the joy part. This is a videotape entitled, Life at the Devil. I, was, I made, it, made this a place one time, and the, the spirit of laughter hit the place. And that's, that, that is a funny video. Now I want you to look at I want you to look at this thing, would you? Dear God in heaven, look at that. That's enough to shake the devil up. That's a whole library of faith tapes. A whole library of faith tapes. Now you can have this. Is this eighty dollars on a well we'll give it to him for a special for sixty this week. We'll give it today, we'll give it to him for a special for sixty. Now real quick like so you'll know what causes to build your faith up so you can have patience in you. These are titled, Faith is the Substance of Things Hoped For. Determined Faith. Now Faith. God watches your faith. By faith, your world is framed. Faith has two ingredients. Action and speaking. And faith, the power of faith. What makes faith work? The gift of faith. How to keep what you receive. Speak the word only. Say it and receive it. Your faith brings victory. How to protect your faith. There's about ten things that causes your faith to work. Call those things that be not as though they were, and your confession brings possession. 
You need to know these things so patience can come in your spirit. If you don't get the Hebrews and the Abraham kind of faith in your own human spirit, you won't have any patience. You'll be like the rest of most all the Christians in the world. You want to pray a little sip side prayer? Well, in Jesus' name, go. Well, that's all right for some people. That's okay for headaches. But homosexuals, you can go around all your life and say, in Jesus' name, go. And say one little prayer or somebody that's crazy in the mental institution, and they ain't going to go. They'll laugh at you. Brother, you got to be determined. Your faith got to be determined. Somebody that's lost their mind, I mean totally lost their mind, have nobody to help them, you can get them free. There is nothing that God won't do for you. All devils have to obey you. I'll take you back to the first scripture I started on as I close. Luke 9.1 plainly says that Jesus, not religion, not somebody else, but Jesus, gives you power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Get rid of that dumb disease in Jesus' name. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Everybody say resist. Yes. All right, let me leave this with you. Take inventory of your life, my brother and sister. I'll get with you tomorrow afternoon. I, tomorrow afternoon, I'll have all afternoon. Praise God forever. But you're going to have to learn to resist the devil yourself, not somebody for you all the time. It's okay to have people pray for you. That's scripture. That's wonderful. But you're going to have to come to a place. Resist the devil yourself. Resist those diseases, my brother and sister. Resist that confusion in your mind. Resist whatever is facing itself upon you that's not victory. Learn in Jesus' name. Resist that dumb thing. And do it with authority like Jesus told you to. And victory is yours. Everybody say, if I obey Jesus. And get the spirit of authority. Say, Jesus. That reminds me of Luke 9 1. You've given me power and authority. I receive the spirit of authority in me. Give it to me, Jesus. Hold your hands up right now. Give it to me, Jesus. Give it to me, Jesus. I receive the spirit of authority so I can come before the throne of God with boldness. Claim what's rightfully mine. And make all devils leave me. In Jesus' name. With authority. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the spirit of authority. I'm happy about it. I think I'll shout. Well, shout then. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. All right, you may be seated. This afternoon I was going to speak on prosperity for you, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm going to teach. I'm going to go ahead and finish what I've been on for the last two or three days and uh, taking authority over devils and how to deal with devils and so forth. But I will let you in since this is the last day. I'll let you know some material that we have that will help you along that line. <clears throat> let me tell you who I am first. Most of you don't know who I am. You only know me my name. I've been a multimillionaire for quite a long time. I've been, I was making four, five, six thousand dollars a week 26 years ago when the Lord came in my car and rode with me for an hour and a half. And I wept bitter tears for an hour and a half. He delivered me from myself. I was an executive in the world. Had everything a young man could possibly want. And then the Lord wanted to put me into ministry, in the ministry of helps. I didn't know he had a public ministry for me. I just wanted, to, he wanted me to help people. So I worked in the ministry of helps using my own money. Never did receive an, receive an offering or anything. For seven years I worked in the ministry of helps while the Lord trained me. I didn't know what he was training me for. I just thought he was training me to help people. So I was satisfied the ministry of help. I didn't ask God for a public ministry. I wasn't interested in a public ministry. People's interested in the spotlight, you know. They're always half nuts anyway. And so, uh, you know, if you want to work for God, build up rewards in heaven. You, know, you get rewards in heaven under your name by helping people. You don't, make, you don't have to teach a Sunday school class to help people. Go help them feed the poor. What difference does it make as long as you get blessed? And... Uh, 
So I was, I was working at the Ministry of Helps. But I was pretty successful, you know, just from an actual standpoint. But uh, after I got to work at the Ministry of Helps, just helping people, not requiring anything in return, after about four or five years of that, the Spirit of the Lord began to come up on me and begin to show me things. I'd go somewhere and help somebody, and me being a businessman, he'd come up on me and show me something that would make me $50,000. I'd go somewhere else and help somebody, and be in my car, and the Spirit of God would come up on me and show me how to make a quarter of a million. And he started doing me that way. And I said, dear God in heaven. One time he made me about 200000 you know, and I said, what? I said, Lord, I don't even need this money. I said, what are you giving it to me for? Well, he said, you passed my test. I said, passed your test? What in the world did I do? Well, he said, you worked with a woman that was living in adultery for eight years and didn't turn against her until you got her saved. And I did. I worked with that woman eight years. No, I never did turn against her. And I finally got her saved after eight years. And she made a phone call to me that made me a couple hundred thousand dollars. He said, that's the way it works with everybody. He said, everybody will receive from heaven on the same level as their soul prospers. See, so your soul has to prosper first. He said, well, I don't know if it's God's will for me to be wealthy or not. Well, you may not know it is, but I know it. Probably better than anybody in this room. I know it's God's will. You have got to be kidding. I know, I mean, God hates poverty, and I know it's God's will for you to be blessed financially and be healthy. I said, Lord, what kind of test did I pass? He said, Third John, the second verse. Did you ever read that scripture in Third John, the second verse? He says, but look, God says, but now this is God talking. Beloved, I wish above all things that you'd be prosperous and be in health. And you can have these two even as your soul prospers. The reason a lot of people don't get don't, don't prosper because they don't do anything for God. You know, they just don't do much. They just want to go to church. Say, well, I love the Lord. I'm going to church. Well, God likes you to go to church, but what about between Sundays? You know, the world's going to hell. Try to help somebody. Jesus said, well, you can't give a, you can't you, you can't give somebody a cup of cold water without me giving you a reward for it. Well, you can imagine what God will do for you if you'd take some food and go feed the poor. Now, if God loves you enough to give you a reward, if you give somebody a cup of cold water, and water don't even cost anything. Well, you can imagine what God will do for you if you take money out of your pocket that you've worked for. And I mean, you just plot it down. Buy a poor family $40, $50 worth of groceries and just pay the man. Get the groceries and take them to their house and give them to them. Bless them in Jesus' name. And uh, you can imagine what God would do for you. He said, Brother Noble, I can't imagine what God would do for me. I never did do that. Well, why don't you try it? God said, people that feeds the poor. God says, I find great favor with people that feeds the poor. Oh, really? Tell me about it. Yeah, you said that right. And when you do that, when you, when you do that for seven years... And you're not looking for anything in return. You'll find out some things about God. See, a lot of reason a lot of people don't get the best of God. They don't know anything about Him. They just know He's nice. They don't know anything about Him. And the reason the devil runs rush out over people, they don't know anything about the devil either. They just think, well, you know, the devil. <laughs> devil don't bother me. And I love the Lord. Are you broke? Yeah. Are you sick? Uh-huh. Are you confused? <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> but there's one thing for sure, devils don't bother me. I go to Lakewood Church. Well, if you go to Lakewood Church, you're a prime target for the devil. The devil likes Lakewood members. He don't bother cold church members very much. Why should he bother them? Because they're not doing anything anyway. The devil wants to stop people doing something for God. If you want to go to an old cold church all the time, you know, and not do anything for God, the devil don't usually bother you because he's already got you anyway. Why should he bother you? 
Your mind's already dense. Why should he make it more dense? But if you're doing something for God, brother, he's on the front line. But I got news for you. It's just exactly like God says. If you'll let your soul prosper by blessing somebody else, God will bless you so much you can't understand it. Now, I am just telling you that he will. But you can't do it just to get blessed financially. I mean, God blesses me like you would not believe financially. And I don't even want it. Well, I want another million for it. I already got one. What do I want another one for? Well, he gives me, he blesses me with another one anyway. And another one. And another one. What do I want it for? I would have thrown it away. I don't throw money away. And I don't have a lust for shopping centers. <laughs> well, I don't. There's a lot of people, you know, if they had money, they got, they have, a lot of people have lust in them. I don't mean just for sex. I mean, all, there's all kinds of lust, you know. I've seen a lot of single people, but they get, they get lustful. They, they, have a lust, they have a lust marriage, a lust devil for marriage, and they get married to the first thing that comes along. And they wish to God they'd never seen them in six months. <laughs> don't lust for marriage, my brother and sister, and give the devil a chance to operate through you and mess you up. Be satisfied with your single days. Go home alone like I do and sit in a room and worship God. Or whatever you want to do. It don't make no difference. Whatever you want to do. Just praise the Lord or play gospel tapes or whatever you want to do. Anything you want to. Watch TV as long as it's not flaky. But play gospel tapes. Play the Bible. I don't go to bed at night playing the Bible. Playing scripture on tapes. I love to go to bed that way. Makes you wake up feeling good. Makes you wake up with a clear mind, not fuzzy. You have to know what to do. To find, you know, the best thing you ever did, people, is learn things that you can do and say and act in your life that God would be pleased with. If you don't strive to please God, you're going to wind up being nothing except a scuzzball. That's all you are. You have to learn to please God. If you'll please God, He will bless you. He'll open the windows of heaven and bless you mightily. I have a whole prosperity package that I offer people. It's, I don't know, it's about $130 or $40 worth of tapes and books for $95. I have it in a sack. And so if you want to uh, learn about that, I'll tell you, it's like four tape series and two books. So if you're taking notes, you can take this down. Put down number one. I must learn to be a servant of God. That's number one. Servant of God and to worship Him. I must learn to be a servant of the Lord. That means help other people. If you don't learn in your life to help other people, God will not help you very much at all. Now you might not backslide, you might go to heaven, but you won't get blessed a lot in this world. You'll get blessed some. God can bless you mightily. Tim, would you get me a glass of water? And then, uh, all right, number two, one of those tape series is how to be a servant of God. Number two is the keys to God's promotion, position, power, and prosperity. God's keys to promotion. If you're on your job, you need to get promoted. God don't want you to sit still. He wants you to get promoted. He wants you to learn how to be a good employee. Do you understand that? Now the third tape series in that special that I have in the prosperity package is Prosperity the Bible Way. That's a $40 tape series just by itself. You can have all the four tape series plus the two books for $95. Prosperity the Bible Way. There is a Bible way and the Bible way, my brother and sister, is to worship God each day and then help other people and do the things that pleases God. And then God will come to you just automatically and start showing you what to do. But until you pass that test, He's not coming. Now, he'll help you along in your business some if you'll ask Him to, that type of thing. But I'm talking about quarter of a million dollar blessings, half a million dollar blessings. 
In fact, last week, I believe it was, a few days ago, I was in Crystal River, Florida, sitting in my house, where I built a sanctuary and had a mission ministry there. Now, Kathy knows this. She knows that I was riding up the road because her dad and mother traveled with me, and she did too, for several years. And she sat on the front, this little girl sat on the front, with her Bible and notes for three years, every, every night I spoke, in, in those days I'd speak 26, 28 nights a month. And she had sat there for three years, every service on the front. I mean, you'd think she's my own child. She had sat there, now you understand this? Every night for three years, she didn't fool around the back nowhere. She sat on the front, with notes and her Bible open every night. God had brought her off a dope and out of a mental institution and she wanted to find everything she could about God. And she would learn and the Holy Spirit would feed her. Now I watched her see. Wasn't very long when she's a teenager now. Everybody say teenager. teenager. One night the spirit of prophecy come upon her. Glory to God. Spirit of prophecy came up on her. You start getting interested in God, and there's no telling what there's no telling what God will give you. You show God if you show God that you're sincere, well, you just might as well look out. Heaven is going to come down and kiss you. Blessed be the name of the Lord God forever. And she started coming to this church sometimes, and sometimes John would call her to prophesy. That's the summer I would let her prophesy. The spirit of prophecy would come up on her. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Everybody say, I love Tim. <laughs> Tim is worthy to be loved, I guarantee you. Now you talk about someone humble you. You know God knows how to humble you. One time I came here three or four years ago, I guess it was, to speak in John's church. He's, I think he'd gone overseas to preach. You know, He's always preaching around the world. John has a vision of the world, you know. Tim come and got me at the airport, and I was going to stay on the I was going to stay here on, on the grounds. And they got more beds on these grounds than most motels. <laughs> they have a lot of they have a lot of buildings. Some people come look at these grounds and say, "You mean this is a church? It looks like a camp to me." Well, that's what it is. And I'm going to stay here in one of the cabins, you know. And Tim brought me from the airport. The fellow that brought this, you know, that nice little fellow brought this up here. And I'm over there in one of the cabins unpacking my clothes, you know, and he'd, he'd let me off, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes, an hour or something. Somebody knocked on the door. I went to the door, opened the door, and Tim was standing there. He said, Brother Norval, he said, Jesus told me to give you this and handed me a $20 bill. I said, Oh, God, Jesus. You know, when you're worth a few million dollars, you know, and little old ladies used to have to put two dollars in my pocket. I told God, I said, God, I don't want them people's money. What do I want their money for? I said, I already got money. I don't even make a salary. I mean, I don't do this. I don't do this to get money. I do it because I'm called. I do it because Jesus rode my car for an hour and a half and anointed me. I do it because Jesus told me if I would obey him and do it, he would go with me every service and anoint me. And he does too. Glory to God, I can feel it coming up on me now. But nearly every time I stand up and talk about Jesus, I feel it coming up on me. I can be sitting around in my room at the hotel or my house or anything else. And especially, I have to watch myself. I can't take off too long. By the time I take off for about seven days and I'm around the house for about seven days, some night, I never will forget one time I'd been off, I thought I'd take off about seven days, you know, maybe a little bit longer. And I'd been off about a week, and I was sitting there in my house, and I had the television set on. And I never will forget that. I don't know what was on, but the television set was on. And I was sitting there, and by myself. And all of a sudden, the presence of God came right through the wall, come over on me, got on me, and I'm sitting there jerking like this. And the Spirit of God got on me, and I'm sitting in my house in the chair by myself and the television on. And the healing power of God began to flow down through my arms and my hands, and I couldn't keep my hands still. And, it, and I was engulfed with God's power, and hot tears began to stream down my face. And right at that moment, 
I would have given $10,000 if I could have been in a church service where some sick people were at. Because you see, about one cold December night, about 19 years ago in Pennsylvania, God told me to cast the devil out of the deaf man. And I walked up to him. He said, I'm a Pentecostal leader and I've been deaf for 30 years. He, yeah, Pentecostal leader and I'm First Baptist. And the Pentecostal leader walked up in the service where I was at and says, God told me if I'd come up here and let you pray for me, that my ears would pop open. He said, I've been deaf for 30 years. A Pentecostal leader asking a First Baptist to pray for him for deaf ears. And Jesus said to me, well, cast that deaf spirit out of him. I said, all right, in Jesus' name, you foul deaf spirit, come out of him! And he fell flat on the floor like he shot him with a gun and both ears popped open. I mean, you know what? God does something, but He does it quick, like a split second. And that night, when I did that now, when I did it that night, all of a sudden about 50 people jumped up out of the seat and run down the front. Run down the front. I reached out like this to pray for them, and when I did, they fell flat on the floor. I said, dear God, what is this? And I just act like an old pro. And I began to walk right, I don't know why I did this. I just began to walk back through the aisles like this in this hotel ballroom. I act like I've been doing, I act like Catherine Cool, but I act like I've been doing this for years. I haven't done it before in my life. And I began to walk back through like this, and they were trying to climb out of the seats to get to me. And I do like this right here, and I'd fall between the seats and follow everywhere. I walked around the ballroom and back up this way and looked around. It looked like it brought a machine gun and shot the whole banquet. And I, I'm standing there looking at these people all look, look like they're dead and the Holy Ghost operating on them and, and dear God and there's an old white-headed Pentecostal man walked up to me and he says he said young man I'm an old Pentecostal missionary he said I haven't seen any power like this in church in 55 years he said we used to have this kind of power back in the early days of Pentecost he said I haven't seen I haven't seen a group of people Lay on the floor looked like they were dead in 55 years. This is the first time I've seen a whole church slain in 55 years. I said, Don't feel bad. I never saw it before in my life. <laughs> but you see, it's been in there ever since. Ever since that night, it's been in there. You have to watch it real close. I can't take off too long. I take off too long and God will move in my room and start melting me. And that put that power in my hands and I wish I'd I'd give $10,000 if I was in some church where there's some sick people I could lay my hands. Because now when that power comes on me, I know if I lay my hands on you, you're going to get healed. Unless you just don't believe it. Of course, if you don't believe it, it's not going to go in you. You know, the divine healing power of Jesus is very delicate. The Holy Spirit is very, very sensitive. And if you, don't, if you just act like you don't believe or you don't want the divine healing power of God, it would jump out of you so fast to make your head swim. It won't heal you either. You just make one remark about it or put it down in one way and God will leave you alone. But if you come with an open heart and free for heaven's blessing, Jesus will heal you so fast to make your head swim. I mean, you oh my God. Brother, I mean, His divine healing power can go through your body and knock out every disease in you that quick and operate on you. Sometimes the Lord will tell me before I go to service, He said, tonight I want to operate. I want to perform surgery. But if you let any pianos play, organs play, I won't do it. I have to have, you know, Jesus wants all the attention. If he's going to, if he's going to perform surgery, he wants you to watch him perform surgery. I was in Chicago four or five nights ago, and I had one of those surgery services. And the Lord told me, he says, I will show you tonight who I want you to stand in front of. He said, don't pray for nobody. Don't pray for nobody. Just, I mean, you know, by the laying on of hands. Now, one, I laid hands on everybody. He said, when you go stand before them tonight, I'll show you the ones I want to. And you just go stand before them. 
and just stand before him and just stand right there and pray in the Spirit. And, and he said, he said I'll, I'll, I'll operate on him. And he did for about 45 minutes. And I'd tell people, I said, now, now watch what the Lord does for this person. And I'd go over and just stand in front of him. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God would move up on him. And he'd start performing surgery on him. And you know, you just stand so much of that. And all of a sudden, they just melt on the floor. And in a few seconds, you know, God would show me somebody else. That went on for about 45 minutes. Blessed be the name of the Lord God forever. But you have to learn to put those things first. Now, those things that God has given to me in my ministry, if I didn't put them first, God wouldn't bless me financially. You have got to be kidding. And I'd be glad to give my businesses away or sell all of them or do anything if God told me to. But He hadn't told me to. I'd be glad to do it if He wanted me to. I don't care. I'm not hung up. It doesn't make a difference to me. I could care less. Because all I want to do the rest of my life is just do what Jesus wants me to do and die and go to heaven. That's all I want to do. Just leave this body and get a new body and go to heaven. And enjoy the Lord and enjoy the angels and enjoy Paul and Moses. I intend to talk to all of them. Glory to God forever. I want to ask Paul how he felt when he swam out in the water 20, 24 hours trying to build the church. Now you talk about a human being going through a living hell. Brother, he went through a living hell trying to get the church started. And that trip that Peter took from the seaside up to Cornelius' house to bring the gospel to the Jews, I mean to the Gentiles. So I want to talk to people like Peter and Paul that, that's responsible for building the church and responsible for you for sitting in this beautiful building. You know, had it not been for that trip from Cornelius' house, I mean from the seaside up to Cornelius' house, you probably wouldn't be sitting here. But Peter paid the price to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Glory be to God forevermore. Paid the price. There's been a price paid, you know. But you sit here in this beautiful building, enjoy. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And have the different kind of ministers come through here. And have the Lord anoint them. And have you come to a beautiful plush altar. And bow down before God. And just let God saturate you with the same power he saturated Paul with. That kept him alive in the ocean when he swam 24 hours in the water. That same power that, the same power that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. When so many souls got saved. Glory be to God forever. I'm telling you that's the same power that gets you. That's the same power you need to work under all the time. All the time when you work. All the time. But if you'll do the things that God tells you to do. God will bless you financially. God will prosper you financially. That's just a side blessing, that's all. You just have to understand that. Sow your seed and do the things that God wants you to do. And so the third tape series in that special that I'm offering you is Prosperity the Bible Way. And then the fourth tape series, so you'll know what it is, as long as I sought the Lord, He caused me to prosper. Well, what does that mean? Well, as long as I feed the poor, or furnish money to feed the poor, as long as I pray for the sick, as long as I help somebody to obey the calling upon my life God will prosper me well he'll do you the same way and I'm not you you say well what kind of calling Brother Norval I don't have no calling I know you do do it what do you mean you don't have no calling well I don't know what it is well read the Bible it's the ministry of helps is what it is oh I don't want that one well what do you want are you you want Oh, I want to sing in public or I want to preach in public. Oh, you want to be a star? Well, honey, there's only one star. And that's not you. Amen. Jesus is a star. Amen. So you might, as well, you might as well, if you don't know what it is, just go ahead and read the Bible. Where God said, I set ministry of helps in the church. I set miracles in the church. And I set apostles in the church. I set prophets. And I set evangelists. I set pastors and teachers in the church. And I set miracles in the church, and I set the ministry of helps in the church, and I set governments in the church. God said, I put these things in the church. And where it's all at, my brother and sister, I'm telling you where it's all at today. Join a church. Join, fasten yourself to a body of believers and join, join them in the army of God. Join them and be faithful there and help that church win the world to Jesus. You understand that? 
Don't be some rebel out here. I ain't belonging to nobody's church. I'm doing my own thing. Uh-huh. Oh, God, help us, Jesus. Uh-huh. Well, then if you're that strong, start a church of your own. Oh, well, I'm a floater. Well, God hasn't called you to float now. I can tell you that. God don't have any floaters. You need to get established somewhere so you can be a blessing. Well, I, you don't know my ministry, Brother Noble. Honey, I don't care what your ministry is. Let God have your ministry. That's right. But get established somewhere where your ministry can bless a local body plus the world. I work out of so-and-so, so-and-so. You understand? I work out of so-and-so, so-and-so. Have some good church and good pastor that you work out of that will bless your ministry. Go out in the mission field and come back and get your pastor. Lay your hands on me. Lay your hands on me, Lord. I mean, lay your hands on me, pastor. Get the pastor to lay his hands on you. And get the people that you love to lay their hands on you. And God will also give you supporters. Well, He will. God will do that for you, though. As long as I sought the Lord, God caused me to prosper. That's the fourth tape series in that thing. As long as I sought the Lord, He caused me to prosper. And there's two free books in there, and I've got those in packages. So they take Master's card and Visa, char- Visa card and American Express and checks. So that particular packet will cost you $95, but it's about $130 or $40 worth of stuff if you want to be blessed financially. And that's the way you get blessed financially. You say, well, I can't afford that. I've got a book that says Prosperity Now. Right now. And if you, want, if, if you can't afford the whole package and you want one tape series, then this package, Prosperity the Bible Way. Prosperity the Bible Way. There's a lot of people that was broke, this millionaire today, because of this one tape series. If you learn the things to do that pleases the Lord, see, you have to understand this about God. <clears throat> He is totally rich. Now you talk about a human being that's rich. I mean, we. <clears throat> I mean, you talk about <clears throat> a person that's rich. As God, I mean, He builds houses out of walls of jasper, ruby floors, and diamond doorknobs. He don't fool around with brick and black tops. He pay, he, he, he puts streets of gold in front of your mansion. Can you imagine, do you ever think in your mind, if you'll work for God and build up some rewards in heaven, can you imagine, can you imagine, can you imagine how much your mansion is going to be worth in dollars and cents? You can take a slice of your living room floor and buy Houston. God builds your mansion out of rubies, jasper, and diamonds, and anything else he wants to. He makes it all anyway. You say, well, wh- where does he get it at? Are you kidding me? God speaks things into existence. He can say a ruby floor up here, and there it is. Oh, really? Tell me about it. Yeah, he spoke you into existence. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. He framed the world by the words that come out of his mouth. God framed the whole world by the words that come out of his mouth. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me please to Luke 9 1. I will pick up where I left off yesterday afternoon. And I won't stay on this very long because I want to, I've got several other things I want to get you to do. And besides that, I want to get you to come to God today. I want, you to, I want you to obey God today and let him give you a... I want to give you a new slant today maybe you've never heard of before on how to get rid of devils. And how to take authority over devils and how to get rid of them. But you must know this, my brother and sister, that you have a spirit of authority on the inside of you if you're born again because God's already given it to you. You say, well, I don't don't feel like I have a spirit of authority, brother Norman. I feel weak. Paul said, stir up the gift that's in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you? Yeah. I don't feel no authority much. Stir up the gift that's in you. Walk the floor and start calling yourself strong and start calling yourself with authority. I have a spirit of authority. You actually have a right, my brother and sister, to call those things that be not as though they were. And the Holy Spirit that lives in you, He will put in you what you need from God. Do you understand that? I can't put nothing in you except some strong teaching, except some Word of God. I can put the Word of God in there, but that's what a teacher is for, is to teach you the Word of God. 
a teacher like myself is not like the average preacher. I don't preach. Well, sometimes I feel like preaching, though. But God called me to teach the Bible. That's the reason He unfolds it to me and dissects it. I can look up, it just unfolds the whole thing to me. Glory to God forever. And you see the thing, you know, you've been reading the scripture for 20 years, and all of a sudden you come along, and the Spirit of God comes on you, 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 you then, then you really see it. See, everything about your life to be successful is in here. You just haven't found it yet. Either you haven't found it, or you're not obeying it one. You can take the, well, you can take this fellow right here in a wheelchair. Now, he's a crippled man, or he wouldn't be in a wheelchair. If he would do what I tell him to do in his living room, oh, he might be in that wheelchair a few months, but he'll come out of that wheelchair. But if you don't do it, I mean, you can be a good Christian and not do it. But if you don't, but, but if you don't do it, then you're not going to. First of all, you have to accept the fact, let's say, that, like he want to walk out of the wheelchair. All right? There's something wrong with your legs, sir. Is it your legs? All right, now you, you see, you have to understand this, that Jesus makes new legs. And in heaven, I've been there twice. In heaven, there's a wire house in heaven, like this. You see, in heaven, there's no worms in the apples. The presence of God in heaven is everywhere. The thing I enjoyed it about heaven more, more than anything else was breathing. Every time you breathe, you breathe in the presence of God. Clean and holy and pure. Blow to God forever. I'd like to say to heaven just so I could breathe. Down here it's like you got a load on you to breathe compared to heaven. Because... Billions of demons trying to smother everything down, you know, and giving you all kinds of bad weather and all that kind of stuff. Honey, in heaven there is no bad weather. And heaven is just like this world. Some people say, well, I'm gonna, I don't want to go to heaven because when I go to heaven, I just live in a place where they got little teeny people that's got wings that floats around on clouds and don't know where they're going. No, that is not what heaven is. you you got a flaky mind. That's not what heaven is. <laughs> heaven is a real world. With how, when you get to heaven, you'll be living in a house. You'll have your own couches. And the more work you do here on the earth compared to the softness of your couch. <laughs> if you don't do no work at all, God might let you sit on the floor. This one boy went to heaven, and he says, you know, Jesus took me over, says Jesus, me and Jesus was walking along, and he said, let's go over here and see these people. I need to go over and see somebody. He said, we went by the office, because they have offices in heaven, secretaries, everything, you know. Oh, really? Oh, they keep a lot of files in heaven, you said that right. You work in heaven, but it's all enjoyable work. You're not just going to be able to float around all the time <laughs> with nothing to do. He, he said, no, well, Jesus said, let's go over to his house. He said, I'm going over there. And he said, and, and, and he said, and Jesus is not an intruder. He knocked on the door. He said, they didn't come to the door for a while. He knocked on it two or three times. He said, they finally come to the door. They come to the door. He said, everything was just normal. They said, hi, Jesus, how are you? He said, we walked in. He says, and some of them come from the back room, and we're sitting there, and he says, and we sit on the couch, he says, there's furniture all in the house. He says, sit on the couch, he says, when you sit down, it's so comfortable, you don't ever want to get up. He said, Every, everything you do in heaven is victory. If you sit down, it's victory. If you stand up, it's victory. <laughs> if you get an apple off of a tree, there's fruit in heaven. If you get an apple off of a tree, another one comes around, you pull an apple off of a tree, another one goes, <laughs> Another ripe apple appeared, already a ripe. You don't have to get green and then ripe. It's already ripe. Everything in heaven is ready. <laughs> Lord, to God forever. You better get ready yourself. Get ready for what? Get ready for the greatest blessing you ever got in your life. 
He said, but he said, and then the couches were so soft. My Lord, he said, the couches were soft. And the chairs in there. He said, we stayed there and talked for a while, you know, and they carried a conversation and talked for a while. And then he says, me and Jesus left. He said, they said goodbye, you know, and everything, you know. And left, he said, then he said, boy, he said, you talk about something else. So he said, when Jesus took me to church, he said, we went to church. He says, dear Lord, have mercy. Help us all. He said, there was something else. He said, there's something else when you go to church in heaven. He said, everybody is full of joy. He said, everybody is full of joy. I said, oh, yeah, you tell me that. Tell me. He said, boy, I'd like to knock me out, though. He says, I couldn't take it. He said, he said, you know, you know, this is what he said. He said, you know, normally, he said, I, when I went to heaven, he said, I never really get to see this. But he said, I could sense in my spirit while I was in heaven, I never saw no children in heaven. He said, but I could sense in my spirit I could pick it up in my spirit when I was there. There was somewhere in heaven, there was a section of heaven where little children live. Oh, I said, I know there is. I said, I've been there. That's, that's the only place I got to go to. Where the little children live that died young. There's a special place and special beautiful buildings. And they have little rooms. I got to go in their rooms looking. They have chairs. There's a special building in heaven and a section in heaven where little children live that died young. If you're in this congregation today and you have a little child that died, well, if you can see where it lived, you wouldn't want to bring it back. There's no harm there. It's all peace and all joy. And God's got it all fixed up just for them. You walk in the building, you walk in the rooms, you walk back out. There's such peace. And everything is so beautiful. And the grass is about ten times as green as it here. And the flowers are about ten times as beautiful they are. And nothing ever decays. I mean, nothing don't decay. It just disappears. I mean, nothing. There's nothing rotten in heaven. It's amazing. You're going to, you're going to be... Now, what's, what's going to make you mad? Now, you say, you may think I'm talking to you kind of strong. No, I'm trying to keep it, I'm trying to keep it, keep it weakened down so you can get it. What's going to make you mad when you get to heaven? Of course, you'll be so glad to be there. When you get to heaven... And you see all the things in heaven. And you see all the wealth in heaven. And you see all the health in heaven. And you see everything that God has made in heaven. And your name is in the great big book. And you're going to see that while you're living on earth, you could have enjoyed any of this that you'd have wanted. All you have to do is claim it by faith and not give up. And let a voice from earth go up to heaven. Thanking God for the scripture you need. Pick out the promise you need in the Bible. Claim it by faith in Jesus' name. And just thank God for it continually. Let your voice go up to heaven and thank God for it continually. In your case, it would be new legs. If your pocketbook is empty, then you ought to thank God for prosperity. You understand that? And honey, you, you just might as well know the truth so you'll know you have, you, you, you're not living with some slipshod God and some apartheid slipshod gospel. That is not what Jesus is. That's what, uh, what the Bible is. It's all at the height of perfection. And I am telling you, I don't care what you look like or where you come from, you can have anything from heaven that you can believe God for. He is more than willing to give you anything in heaven. Now what will start you when you go into a big wire house like this and you see eyeballs staring at you and you see legs hanging on the wall and you see kidneys hanging on the wall and you see arms and you see ears and you see everything you want. Every part of the human body and, 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 and all of it's fresh and new but it never decays. And... Uh, that's the sad part. That's the sad part. And you only see a little vacant spot here and there, not very much. And that's where Jesus gets the most, that's where he's the most saddest at. Because it's all these parts of the body, he says, all of these were made for the church and for all of my children that needs one. But they don't, they, but they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't claim them enough. He said, if they would claim them, he said, if they would claim any part they need, 
Now get this, if they would claim any part they need for their body and not doubt me, but just keep on thanking me for it month after month after month and glorifying my name, all of a sudden one day, it would appear. But if you ever stop thanking God and ever stop worshiping God and you let your mind wonder, well, I wonder why God hasn't given it to me. I've been praying for two years. My God, I've been praying for two years. And I haven't given it to me yet. You know, you wonder sometimes if Christians ever read the Bible. Don't you know that the longer you wait before the manifest, the longer you believe God and the longer you thank God for it, for one of his promises, and the longer you glorify his name, all the waiting period between the prayer and the manifestation, you ought to pray, if you knew the end result, you'd probably pray it'd be five years. Because all the time of the waiting period, it is for your benefit. Because sometimes if God makes you wait four years for something and you thank Him for it and then you get it, then once you do that, now listen to me closely, once you do that, you'll be delivered from the clock. You'll be delivered from the calendar. You'll be delivered from time. Because in faith there is no time. God, don't, God, don't, God does not wear a bull over. He don't even believe in watches. Only you and me where I watch so we can get, go to work on time. Stuff like that. Time is not that important to God. You understand? Because with God, with God and the Bible, everything is now. Faith is right now. Salvation is right now today. Make up your mind. Healing is right now. Make up your mind today. I'm going to get blessed financially. Now. I'm going to do it now. Well, just start helping people then. And start the money you make next week. Give some of it to Jesus. Give some of it. Give some of it to the gospel. And start helping people. And you watch what God does for you. When will I do it, Brother Novel? When will I do it? Oh, shut up! <laughs> if that's the kind of attitude you got, He won't do it. You, you, you can't do that. You have to do it. You have to do it to others because that you love Jesus. Do it to them because that you love Him. And don't look for nothing in return. If, you, if you're doing it, for, for and, oh, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get a reward, and I'm going to get a reward real quick. Oh, yeah, and I'm doing a lot for God, and I'm going to do it for God, and I'm going to get a reward. I want my rewards, my rewards, my rewards, my rewards, my rewards, my rewards. My rewards. Uh, you know what's going to happen to you? Honey, you ain't going to get any. You have a reward brain. You don't have a love brain. Do it unto them as you would do it unto Jesus. You understand that? And as you do it unto them, you do it unto Him. It's just the law, that's all. If you do it, it's a law. But you don't do it just to make money. God, the Bible, is not a money-making scheme. Did you understand that? The plan of God is not a money-making scheme. But when you are sincere and you obey God, it just comes automatically, and you don't never know when it's coming, but it'll come. Now, Kathy knows this for sure. The Spirit of God came on me about 12 years ago and told me to buy a piece of property in Florida, and I bought it, and made a, he wanted to make a mission out of it. So I just I signed my name on a ninety thousand dollar piece of property so I could pass out tracks on it. He said, now, Brother Noble, I am not spending no ninety thousand dollars to pass out tracks. Forget that stuff. Well, uh, you you bet if God tells you to, you better. And I bought it, you talk about ugly, that's the ugliest piece of property I ever seen, nearly. We hauled eighteen truckloads of trash off of it and I bought it. You talk about a scuzzy looking place. I don't think anything but skulls balls that lived there for years. Eighteen truckloads of trash we haul off of the property. And just a few days ago, a man sat in my house. I couldn't believe it. He sat in my house. He said, I'm a Presbyterian, but I've been having your books and tapes, and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I work for a real estate company here in town. And he said, Mr. Hayes, he said, I guess you know that that piece of property you have on Highway 19 is, so, is, is a prime piece of property. Now then they're going to build a shopping center next to it. And he said, I've got some investors here in town. He says, and it wants to buy it. I said, well, you don't want to buy that property. He says, why? I said, because I've already been offered a million four hundred thousand for it. He says, 
You have? And I said, yeah. Well, he said, what if I, he said, what if I got you a million six hundred thousand cash after real estate companies pay? This is to your part. Would you be willing to sell it for a million six hundred thousand cash to your part? I paid ninety thousand for it. And the Lord told me to buy it. Because I would not have bought it. You, got, you have got to be kidding. I am not spending no $90,000 to pass out tracts unless God tells me to. But if He tells me to, I will. And I did too. And I, said, I, I thought to myself, I can't believe this guy is sitting here like this. But he is begging me to take a $1,600,000. I says, oh my God, Jesus. I says, no. I said, no, I, I, I don't know. I said, I have to pray about this. He said, well, what do, what do you mean pray about it? I wouldn't have to pray about it. I'd get it now. <laughs> well, I've got to so fall on in my life. They don't, they, don't, they don't rule me no more. See, you, you see what I mean? You, have to, you know, I had money when the Lord came to get me, so it don't bother you, no. It don't bother you. You think, I'd be happy, Brother Norval, if I had a million dollars. My God, if I had 200000 I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't be happy. That's crazy. That's not where happiness is found. You're not going to be happy just because... I don't care if you got a, a truck full of money. A truck full of thousand dollar bills. That's not going to make you happy. You find happiness on the inside of you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. That's where you find happiness at. You're not going to be happy. I don't care if you own a big motel. And I don't care if you got millions of dollars. And I don't care if you got a ball on one arm and a brunette on another arm. You're not... Uh, for this girls in town, you're not going to be happy. I guarantee you're not going to be happy. That's not what makes you happy. You find happiness from Jesus. Glory to God forever. And that's the only place you find it. And you find it by having faith in Him. Refusing to doubt God. And listen to what He says and obey Him. And the beautiful manifestations of heaven begins to come down and visit you. Jesus said in Luke 9, 1, He said, Then He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Oh, know that you have power and authority in you over all devils and to cure diseases. Do you understand that? Now then, turn with me, please, to the book of James. First chapter of the book of James. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let's start with the first verse. I'm going to read straight through this for a few verses. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Remember what I told you? It takes two years to get it. You'll have more patience, more faith. You'll be stronger. You and me need all the strength we can get. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be entire, perfect and entire, wanting nothing. When your faith gets to be perfect, you will want nothing because you'll have everything. And you'll know, you'll be just like Abraham. You'll know that anything heaven has, you can get it, my brother and sister. Everybody say, God is my Father. And God owns heaven. And I'm His very own child. He's written my name in his book. I've inherited everything he's got. And my father in heaven has a loving heart and a giving heart and a willing heart that I can have anything he's got. So if I have patience and not doubt him, and I believe my faith before I see it. And if I thank Him for it before I ever see it, my Father someday in His time will let me see it. And He will. Oh, He will. He'll let you see it. Let you see what? Anything you want. And don't think something's too hard for God. He makes things. And He'll create things for you. 
Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. All right, now here's where you get in trouble at. This is where the devil comes in, my brother and sister. And I'm talking, I'm talking to you. I'm teaching the body of Christ this afternoon. I'm, I'm not talking to a bunch of sinners. This is where the devil comes in and rips you apart. Just because you, won't, you, don't, you don't keep your mind steadfast in your thinking. When you don't get what you want as quick as you want it, you allow your mind to wonder. And when you allow your mind to wander off of faith, it leaves a vacuum in your life for seducing spirits to come in and operate. If you keep your mind and your heart and your voice full of faith and full of victory and full of thanksgiving, those little vacuums in your life wouldn't be in there for the devil to come in and wallow around. But when you let your shield of faith down and you drop your sword, and you're not for sure you have the blessed fruit of righteousness on now, you're not for sure you do. Where the wiles of the devil will bounce off of you if you'll believe God by faith and use His Word. Devils will try to appear to you, but they can't ever get anywhere. Because you have a sword in your hand, which is the Bible. And God wants you to learn today, if you don't know it, to read the Bible to devils. Most human beings in the world does not read the Bible to devils. Did you ever read healing verses to a cancer and make the cancer eat them? If you'll make the cancer eat healing verses, feed it healing verses for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner at night, and I'll guarantee you it won't be but a few days till it will start vomiting them up. It can't take it. It can't take it. It can't take it. Why can't it take it? Because, honey, healing verses from heaven makes cancer vomit. It chokes it to death. What does that mean? That means it has no life, so it can't spread. It can't increase. It has to decrease. It can't increase. It has to decrease. You understand what I'm saying to you? It can't increase and kill you. It has to decrease, my brother and sister. That's the reason I suggest that tape series to you, How to Live and Not Die. It tells you exactly what to do in cases. If you have any friends, buy them on this afternoon, how to live but not die. Because I give it to you in fine detail exactly what to do to cause cancer and diseases to decrease and for strength and health to increase. You have to feed. Now, as long as you feed that cancer or allow this kind of spirit to operate in your life, wondering and somebody else praying for me, and I'm going to get this person to pray for me, and I'm going to get that person to pray for me, and you look at the human beings all the time. You know what happens to you? You make God mad at you. When you look at the human beings all the time, you make God upset at you. God don't want you looking at human beings all the time. He wants you looking at Him. God said, I've sent my word to heal you. He has sent my word to heal you. All you have to do is claim it in Jesus' name. Keep the doubt out of you. Doubt is an enemy to faith. Doubt causes devils to visit you and have lunch with you. They'll camp out at your house. And they'll do everything to their children. You know why devils do things to your children and to your family? Because, honey, you don't run them off. Why don't you run the devil off? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I know you don't know, but you ought to know. Devils don't have a right to operate on your property if you just do that. You have to bind the devils in Jesus' name. Bind them up. Make them leave your property. Make them leave your children. 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 Walk the floor. My daughter was on drugs. I had to walk the floor for three years. No, you won't ever take my daughter to hell. You're not going to kill my daughter. Then she'd have a friend to die with overdose of drugs and have the funeral. Then I'd walk the floor. No, you're not going to kill her. You're not going to kill my daughter. I, I, I went to see her for two weeks. A few weeks go by, a few months go by, another friend of hers would die. I'm not talking about outlaws. I'm talking about pretty nice people. 
Remember that boy? Remember that nice boy? Bobby had the Canterbury shop on North Okoy Street. On North Okoy Street. He owned a men's clothing store. Nice young fellow in his 20s owned a men's clothing store. I used to go in there and buy stuff from him, talk to him all the time. Just like my daughter started fooling around the wrong crowd. They always said, well, come on, try this. Have you tried this? Have you took this pill yet? Have you tried this? It makes you feel woozy, you know. And try this, and try this, and try this, and try this. It's not very long till you're trying this one. And then it's not very long till you're trying two of them. It's not very long till you're trying three of them. It's not very long till the devil sucks your mind out and you take too many of them and you just die with an overdose. That's what happened to him. He just died. You take an overdose of drugs and you just die. Millions of young people the last 25 years has died overdosing on drugs in this country. Which is a sad mess, my brother and sister. A total sad mess. Now let's get down here and show you the enemy, the enemy of your faith. And when you, when you yield to the enemy of your faith... It cuts God off completely and causes the devil to come in. Now notice number, verse number 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now listen closely. God said, if you're going to doubt him, don't even let you think that you're going to receive anything from God because you're not going to receive. Notice verse 8. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Go back to verse 7. For let not that man that wavereth, in other words, even think in his own mind that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Don't let him think he's going to receive because you're deceiving him. If you don't tell people the truth, you're deceiving them. I mean, just nice, nice sermons that kind of makes you <clears throat> feel good, sometimes they can be deceiving I mean, you need to know the truth, my brother and sister. Know that your whole world is framed by words in Jesus' name. So <clears throat> if you start doubting, you're going to allow the devil to come in and really mess you up if you start doubting. <clears throat> you need <clears throat> to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive that power that he's given you, power, to overcome all devils and to, and, 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 and to get rid of all diseases, power. <clears throat> How can you do that? You can do it just because <clears throat> if you'll <clears throat> excuse me, you'll do it just because if you obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother, a few days ago, God reminded me of that so real because I was standing there, you know. Where was you standing? I was standing in the upper room in Jerusalem. I took a tour a few days ago. Just a short time ago, I took a tour of ministers to Jerusalem. Every time I go to Jerusalem, I have a service in the upper room. And they all got in there, and I, God had been dealing with me. And I opened up my mouth. I opened up my mouth. And began to minister to them. And the Spirit of God came on me. And came on people all over around me. Came on, we didn't just bless people. And I just opened my mouth and said, Well, the people here one day and obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ to know There was over on Mount Olivet when Jesus stood and told them. He said, Don't leave Jerusalem, told his disciples and people around him. Don't leave Jerusalem until you wait. He said, I want you to wait for the promise. Wait for the promise that God's promised you. And Jesus told him, he said, it is true that John the Baptist came and was a great man. No man, Jesus said, ever come out of the womb of a woman that's been any greater than John the Baptist. And said, he, it is true that John the Baptist preached the message of repentance from God and baptized in water. 
But he said, it is true that John preached, you shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Now Jesus said, I'm telling you now, before I go back to heaven, I'm telling you now. Don't leave Jerusalem, but I want you to wait for the promise. The promise of what? Now this won't make you nervous with it. The promise of tongues. Tongues? What's tongues got to do with devils? What's tongues got to do with it? Honey, if you knew what it was meant for, it's got a lot to do with it. And I'm going to know you'll know it if you mention it. He said, so wait for the promise that's promised to you. Went right up through the air to heaven. All of a sudden, two men appeared in white apparel. Why standing you here gazing at him? Everything he says to you, that's the way it'll be. He will come again. Everything he said to you, that's the way it is. And you better obey him. So brother, Peter and disciples decide to obey him. So it's about a day's journey from Mount Olivet where that took place into Jerusalem to the upper room. About a full day's walk. So they walked and a bunch of people followed them and they made their way into the upper room where Peter stood up and talked to them and counted them as about 120 people there. The mother of Jesus was with them. Peter was there and James and John and Matthew and different ones was there and Judas, the brother of James and uh, they were there. And they decided, well, we better just obey him and not wait for the promise. Because Jesus said, don't wait for, wait for the promise. Don't leave Jerusalem until you have the promise. What's the promise? Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until you get the promise. Promise of what? Promise of power. Until you're endued with power from on high. Don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Power. Glory be to God forever. You and me need all the power we can get. Everybody say power. power. Well, learn that. You need all the power you can get. Power, glory to God forever. But they didn't know what they was getting. They didn't know what was going to be written later on with Paul writing in Corinthians. So they prayed for ten days and ten nights and all of a sudden here it come like a rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire set up on each one of them. And they began to pray, and when that power came into Peter, stood up and preached on the day of Pentecost, and got about 3,000 souls saved. Blessed be God forever. Now you may be in here today and says, Brother Norval, I've been having a time with the devil. I've been having a time with disease. I've been having a time with confusion. My pocketbook is empty. All these things you're talking about, heaven is mine. That's in heaven. I don't have them. They're in heaven, but I don't have them. Why don't you have them? I don't know. Well, I don't know. But you ought to know. You can know it. You can know after this afternoon. You don't have to have fourteen thousand sermons. You can know this after this afternoon, and you'll know exactly how to get them. You'll know exactly how to change your situation and break the power of devils. I never was as shocked when God got me involved in this. Several years ago, you say, well, this is a slipshod teaching session you've got today. Well, don't worry about it. It'll come out right at the end, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> and you'll see the whole picture at the end, because it's already in me like a storybook. It's already in me like a storybook. Blessed be God forever. I just take side roads sometimes. <laughs> just share the scripture. We use short scripture. I don't have to read this scripture to you to teach this lesson to you. I already know it from experience. Blessed be God forever. I already know it. I know where the scriptures are found at and the benefits of them. You say, well, why should I be like the day of Pentecost? Why should I wait? Why should I pray? Why should I come before God and wait for the promises promised me? Why should I? Because so you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and receive power from on high. Oh, Really? Yes, really. If you have power on the inside of you, the power on the, you can make devils leave you alone. Bind up 
devils in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and make them leave you alone. If you have enough power in you, enough appreciation in you, enough thanksgiving in you, you have new legs. You understand that, sir? You have new legs. But the voice is going to have to come out of his body up to heaven. New legs, Jesus! New legs, Jesus! Thank you, Lord, for new legs, Jesus! Now, sir, you do that sometimes. Just sit in your living room and do that for an hour. Until you get tired and the rest of all, do it again. Let, let, let that kind of a voice from you go up to heaven several times every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. Don't even miss a day. Every day. If you get tired doing it, resist the spirit of tiredness and command it to leave you and start again by faith. And just thank you for new legs. Jesus, Jesus. I want to thank you, Lord, this morning for two new legs. I call my legs strong in Jesus' name. Jesus! Two new legs, Jesus! Now, I'm telling you, after a few days or a few weeks or a few months or a year or two or whatever, nobody knows when. Nobody knows when. Get that straight. Nobody knows how long or when. And if anybody ever tells you they do, order them out of town. Don't listen to them. Throw all your notes away. Don't listen to them because they don't know what they're talking about. Well, I believe the Lord's going to come in three years, Brother Noble. I said, no, oh, you're as flaky as a $3 bill. You don't know nothing about it. Every time people say that, it don't ever come to pass. Did you ever notice that? They've been saying that for years. Some people ask me, says, Brother Noble, when do, you know, when do you think the Lord's going to come? I said, I have no earthly idea don't know anything about it. It's none of my business. I said, only God knows. I said, Jesus don't even know how to work it, I know. <laughs> well, I think he's going to come. I had a man to tell me about ten years ago. He says, well, I've, I've, I've said it, and I think it's, going to, it's not going to be over three years. I think he's going to come in three years. I said, oh, you do. Since that time, that guy's backslid and got another wife. One flaky thing brings another one on, you know. You start being flaky, you know, you'll, you, you'll wind up being a flake yourself. You have to be steadfast, my brother and sister. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. So turn with me, you say, well, why should I speak with tongues? Well, all right, turn with me to the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians and you'll find out. Why should I fool around that kind of stuff like the day of Pentecost? So you can receive power from on high. You need all the all of your missionaries. You need all the power you can get. Notice the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians and the second verse. Now listen closely. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth him how be, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Blessed be God forever. You need to get baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. Because, my brother and sister, so you can talk to God. You need to talk to God. You're just like me. You need to talk to God. If you want to talk to God in His language, you know, yesterday afternoon, when I left here yesterday afternoon, I went someplace, and I prayed in tongues, I guess, for over an hour. And I got the feeling so good, I couldn't understand it. I mean, I got, man, power started coming in me. I mean, I could just, I, I felt like I could pick up a building. I know I couldn't, but I mean, I felt like I could pick up a building. My spirit got so strong. Yesterday afternoon when I left here, I must have prayed in tongues for over an hour. And I mean, brother, it got good. Hey, it'll get good to you too if you pray for an hour. Over an hour. What will happen to you? Power will start coming in you. You will feel power in your spirit. You will feel power in your mouth. You'll feel power in your brain. You'll feel power in your eyes. What kind of power? The power of victory, my brother and sister. The power of victory. It'll build you up so you can really believe what God is saying to you is true. The power of victory. Notice down, oh really, notice verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. 
That means edifying means building himself up. Build himself up. Build himself up. And you need all the power you can get. Just like Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Wait for the promise! John only baptized you in water. But you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Wait and pray. Wait. Wait for the promise. Don't leave Jerusalem. Peter, James, John, Matthew. Don't leave Jerusalem. And don't take these people with you from Jerusalem. Wait for the promise that's promised to you. So you can receive power from on high. If you get that power, you can be a witness to me anywhere in the world you go to. Any nation you go to. Any town you go to. And even to your friends around where you live. You can be a witness anywhere you go. But you've got to have that power on the inside of you. Oh, thank God for the power. Thank God for tongues. You say, what in the world has this got to do with devils? Unusual, unusual sermon, isn't it? Unusual lesson. Well, you're going to find out first class in a minute. One time God sent me. I received a phone call at my house one time. I never will forget it as long as I live. My phone rang and some woman was on the other end of the phone and she said, she says, is this Norval Hayes? And I said, yes it is. She said, you have been elected. I said, oh really? I didn't know I was running for anything. <laughs> oh, she was all enthused and said, you have been elected. I said, oh really? What was I running for? Well, she said, my name is so and so. She said, I live up in the state of Indiana. And she said, we have a women's group up here, and full gospel business been here in town and so forth, you know. But she said, we have had, we got 30, I believe it was 38 women that's been praying together for three years. Well, I thought that was pretty good dedication. And I noticed while she was talking to me, I began to feel the presence of God when, she, when this woman was talking to me. And I thought, is this a wild woman or is this real? I feel the presence of God here. She said, we've been praying for three years together as 38 women. So we decided we want to have a seminar here in town at the Holiday Inn Ballroom. And we were at the ballroom and we decided we take a vote on speakers. Some wants Kenneth Hagin, some wants Kenneth Copeland, some wants Derek Prince, some wants you, some wants this, and some wants that, and some wants this, and some wants that. So we decided for everybody to write the name of who they wanted and put it in a box. And so we'd count all of them and the one the names on the most pieces of paper We'd call them first if they would come hold a three-day seminar. And if they couldn't come, we'd call the next one. And if they couldn't come, we'd call the next one. If they couldn't come, we'd call the next one. We'd just keep on calling until somebody said yes. And said, Brother Norval, we counted the pieces of paper, and you were elected. Your name was on more pieces of paper than anybody else. And said, you have been elected. What do you think about that? I said, I have no earthly idea what to think. I don't even know you, lady. Yeah, but she says, I'm a legitimate. And she says, you've been elected. And I, you know, talking to her on the phone, I couldn't understand when I hung up. But I told her, I said, okay, yeah, I'll come. When I hung up, I started out of the room, I thought, what does that come for? I don't even know her. I don't even know what I'm getting into. I said, what, what does I say that for? I said, oh, no, well, I, back out of, I, I guess I'll go. So I did go, and it was kind of wild, real nice, though. But I went there and taught you know, I guess Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Night. Now Thursday, when I was teaching there, well, I mean, I guess it's about Friday night or Friday night, Saturday, Saturday morning. This real distinguished-looking man came up to me and he says, "Do you know?" He said, "I notice when you pray for people, sometimes if you lay hands upon them, they fall out in the floor." I said, "Only if anointing is on me. I don't knock about in the floor. That's between them and the Lord." He said, I am the pastor of the largest Pentecostal church in this city. He said, I was praying, Brother Norval. And he said, God told me to invite you to come to my church and speak Sunday morning and Sunday night. But he said, I don't know how I'm going to do that because I don't, I don't believe in falling out. I preach in my church against falling out. And he said, when you pray for people sometimes by the laying of hands, they fall out. I said, well, I don't have anything to do with it. I said, because it's anointing that's on me. I said, I don't have anything to do with it. He says, well, I know God wants you to come to my church. Because he told me he did. And I'm afraid not to ask you. But I've been preaching against falling out. He says, and I don't know what to do. I said, well, make up your mind. He said, are you busy Sunday? I said, no, I finish here Saturday night. 
and I'm not busy Sunday. He says, well, I, I said, well, you can let me know before. I said, you can let me know Saturday night. Make up your mind what you want. He says, all right. He said, I'll talk to you later. Saturday night was the last night, and I'm going to have a healing service by the laying on of hands Saturday night so all the people can get prayed for, you know, and so. That night I taught on, I taught on healing. And I gave an invitation. They lined up all the way across the front of the ballroom, Holiday Inn. And, I, and God did anoint me real strong, and I began to pray for him. I began to pray for him, and I, I came to a crippled person, just laid him out, they just, God just laid him out on the floor, and healed him on the floor, they just got walked off, and the place was already wild, you know. Something like that happens, you know, the whole place goes wild. And so I, I come to the last one, now listen real close and don't miss the thing. I come to the last one, and I laid my hands on the last person that came up for healing. I turned around like this, started towards the pulpit to dismiss the people or turn it back over to somebody that was going to dismiss them. And the Spirit of God on the inside of me said to me, There's a demon-possessed woman in the congregation. What are you going to do about it? I said, Well, I hadn't planned to do anything about it, Lord. He says, Well, Mark does something about it. Matthew tells you to do something about it. I said, okay, Lord, that's right, since you reminded me of God's word and what it says. See, some preachers, even preachers, they don't want to be reminded of what God's word says. They want to do things the way they want to do it, when they want to do it, any time they want to do it, and they think that's right. But always remember this, men and women. Nothing you do is right in the eyes of God unless it's scriptural. I mean, you and me can build church buildings and have all kinds of services, do all kinds of things. And I can dream up all kinds of things if you, want to get, if you just want to do things. I can, print you, I can print you a beautiful program. I'm from the First Baptist Church. I know what programs are. I can print you a professional program and have a professional choir, professional singers, and I can make you think that we just all came from Harvard. So professional. And that's all you get. <laughs> about all the power you get is enough, about enough to wink with. <laughs> that's all the power you get. I said, yeah, okay, Lord, since you remind me what the Bible says, since you remind me what the Bible says, I'll, I, 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 I'll go ahead. I said, I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and pray for her. And, and the Lord, now listen closely. And the Lord said to me, show me. See, God don't believe nothing. Now, this is going to come a shock to you. Did you know that God don't believe nothing you say? I bet you thought that God believed everything you said. No, He don't believe nothing you say. He only believes what you do. You can tell God you're going to cast out devils. You can tell God about your church. You can tell God all kinds of things, what you're going to do, you know, sometime, <laughs> sometime, but never right now. But always remember, Jesus is right now, not next month. And there's a demon-possessed woman in the congregation. And Jesus said to me, what are you going to do about it? I started bringing scriptures before me. I said, okay, okay, Lord. I'm going to go back there and pray for her, take authority over that thing. He said, show me. When he says, show me, your sermons are over. You've got to go take action. <laughs> if you don't, you'll sit around and talk yourself out of it. So I just, I knew where she was at. I knew who she was. I'd never seen her before in my life, but I saw her looking at me out of those demon-possessed eyes while I was speaking. And so I come up behind the pulpit. I walked back like that, and I got back a few rows from her. And I pointed my finger toward her and I said, In Jesus' name, I command you to turn this woman loose and you come out of her. When the ballroom is packed out of full of people, she stood up to her feet. Put her hands on her hips like this. Stuck her chest out and said, 
in Lucifer's name, I won't come out. And uh, <clears throat> nobody would have to tell me, but I knew real quick, like, I had my work cut out for me. And I said, dear God, now this is why I learned something new about God. I learned what Jesus said on Mount Olivet. Right before he went back to heaven through the air. And when he did, two angels from heaven appeared and said, Why standing why are you standing here gazing at him? And just like he said it, that's the way it is. And old Peter said, I believe it. Let's make our way to Jerusalem. It's a day's journey from Mount Olivet to Jerusalem. But Peter said, let's make our way to a little walk into Jerusalem. Because Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until you get the promise. Don't leave Jerusalem until power comes upon you. Glory to God. And the power didn't come until after ten days and ten nights. Of praying to God. Praying to God. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Let me that real quick like I'm finish. Go right there. God just reminded of one how to pray effectively. Stand there, Tim. I'm going to take but a second here. Now here's a tape series. The power of intercession. Which I'll come to that in a minute. But here's what I want you to notice right now. How to pray effectively. There is a way to pray, but there's another way to pray effectively. And then into groanings and pray and intercession to get victory from heaven is the power of intercession. Now I believe these two tape series are $60. So if you want both of these tape series, you can buy them individually for $30 a piece. But if you want both of these for $6, I'm going to give you this one. It's also prayer the balance with prayer and fasting. The balance with prayer and fasting. So if you want that prayer, how to pray effectively. Well, the Holy Ghost taught me something. I didn't know what to do. I never even dreamed of such a thing in my life. I never dreamed of such a thing. And I walked back to her and I said, in Jesus' name, come out of her! She said, no! And I climbed over the seats and got to her. And I said, in Jesus' name, come out of her! And she fell backwards against the seats and says, No! And we started cursing. No! Look out of here! Jesus! No! We started cursing and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I didn't know it, but those precious 38 women, no wonder God sent me there. No wonder I was elected. 38 women had been praying for three years. And been praying for this woman for three years. She was a Satan worshiper. And that you that don't know anything about it, I'll just inform you a little bit about it. When you give your life over to Satan completely, he gives you power from darkness. And you have to go through initiations to belong to the Satan church. And the first initiation you go through with to belong to the Satan church... is you have to have a sex with all the men in the church in the nude, in the altar, in front of everybody. All of them. Now she had done that. This is on Sunday morning. That's the real light initiation. That's, that one don't mean much. The second initiation she had performed, and she had done that, you have to drink human blood in front of the church. That's the second initiation that she goes through with. You drank human blood in front of the church. Now you've got one more initiation before you receive you receive some power when you do that from Satan. But if you want to have if you want if you want to be a high priest of Satan and want to have a lot of power from Satan, then the final initiation, you have to kill a child. Any child, it doesn't make a difference what child, that's the reason a lot of people disappeared and never owned again. Thousands of them. 
You have to kill a child, and the child that you killed yourself, not somebody else, but a child that you killed yourself, you drain the blood out of it, and you bring the, show them that you killed the child, and you drain the blood out of it, and you bring the blood to church on Sunday morning, and you drank the blood from a child that you killed for Satan in front of the whole church. You drank it, and then you become a high priestess of Satan, and then Satan begins to give you power. Like, you know, you can have the power to, like, uh, to make this lamp sit on this table, get up and go through the air and sit on this lamp, sit on this table. Well, remove yourself from this table and go over here. Demons will move it for you when you get to the power of a high priestess and a high priest of Satan, but you won't see the demons just like you don't see angels. And, of course, it's always, if your spirit feels always an eerie feeling in the presence of the Satan to that degree, you understand? And she'd gone through two initiations, but she refused to kill a child, this lady. She refused to kill a child and drink his blood in front of the church, and she refused to do it. So every Sunday when she'd go to church, they would whip her with a whip. Because she refused to do it, they would whip her with a whip. And she knew she had some power from Satan, but she would not reach on in and get the power of the high priestess and kill a child. And worship Satan and be doomed and down forever. Because she had 38 precious women in that town praying for her. they have been praying three years. And now that I come face to face with her, and Jesus said, What are you going to do about it? It may start some of you, but even though the shape she was in, after having sex with every man in the church in the altar, after drinking human blood in the altar for Satan, do you know that Jesus still loved her? That's the kind of God you and me serve. Jesus still loved her. Blessed be His holy name. In Jesus' name. And boy, she fell back in those chairs out of her back. And her mouth come open, her tongue come out, and she was screaming at the top of the voice and cursing everything else, and calling Jesus all kind of names. And I was standing over the top of her in Jesus' name. Come out of her! I said, turn her loose! Come out of her! And I said it four or five times real strong to let that devil know. I said, God sent me here to cast you out, and you're not going to keep this woman. I'm not going to let you keep this woman in Jesus' name! Come out of her! I said! And all of a sudden, then the Spirit of God said to me, I never would have dreamed it in my lifetime, never heard it before or since, but I've been using it ever since then, and it works all the time. And it works all the time. I mean, it works all the time. Blessed be God forever. And the Holy Ghost said to me, this is plain. He said, call 40 people up here and have them to get around her and pray in the Spirit, pray in tongues, loud and strong. Hey, I'm just like you, my brother and sister. I don't know everything. But the Holy Ghost does. Glory to God. Romans chapter 8, real quick, before we close. Romans chapter 8, real quick. And I'm going to show you. Now, don't try to pick things. This means anything. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say, I don't claim to know everything. But the Word of God does. Jesus does. And I look at Romans 8, verse 26. The Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And He, glory to God, He, yeah, He's a person. And He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now look up here, let me teach you something real quick, like. And we say, well, what's the will of God? I already know the will of God. The will of God for any human being 
is to be, have, be victorious and be free from all devils. The Bible is the will of God. Victory is the will of God. The price that Jesus paid is the will of God. The abundant life is the will of God. For you to be free from all devils is the will of God. And the, and the Holy Spirit makes intercession for you and He prays. He prays for the will of God. Which is total victory. That means He prays for victory for you all the time. Prays for victory. He does. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Prays for victory. Well, I don't remember at that time if I'd been doing any, I'd been doing any long fasting. I don't know if I'd been doing overabundance of prayer or not. I'd probably been, I'm sure I'd been praying some for the services and things like that, you know. But when you're upon a devil that's strong, they don't come out so easy. And I'm telling you boldly, people, you need the Holy Ghost. You need the Spirit of the living God. You, yeah, the Lord said to me, call 40 people up here and have them pray in tongues loud and strong over this woman. I turned around and said, 40 of, this is Indiana, I said, 40 of you Hoosiers come up here, God said real quick, like those that are praying in tongues, and get around this woman. And they got around her, they got around her, and she began to scream. She was screaming at the top of her voice, and here's 40 Hoosier voices. And I'm telling you, you couldn't hardly hear her. I couldn't even get back to her no more. They come. You know, it's good to have brothers and sisters who obey God. And so I just went over, you know, and they just kept on praying. Now, Kathy's mother here, she was with me, her mother and father, and they were taking care of my books and tapes at that time, and her mother is strong. She watched it for a while, she started fighting devils herself, she got to, she got to, she, she got to where she's just like me. Just cast the devil out of anything that didn't move. And brother, she wasn't ashamed either. I could say, Brenda, honey, get up there, you see, go back to her, there's a tenth, tenth row back there on the end, there's a girl back there, she's got a devil cast up thing out of her. Boy, she wouldn't even question me. She'd get up out of her seat and walk back there and say, In Jesus' name, come out! I mean, right in service. And if that thing started tackling her, she'd say, No, in Jesus' name, come out! I said, Well, she taught me for three years. If you taught me for three years, you'd be like that. Well, it's the truth, you would be. I guarantee you, you would be. And so I... So I, so I sat down over here, and I'm sitting over here, and here comes this distinguished looking guy, Pastor, the largest Pentecostal church in town. And he said, come over and he says, How you doing, Brother Oval? I said, Just fine, boy. I said, These workers for God here. I said, I'm telling you what's the truth. They're getting with it, aren't they? I said, That devil, that devil and that woman won't be able to stand that very long. I said, You can't stand, you can't stand that kind of power coming up on you that long. And so he says, Well, he said, Oh, man, isn't that wonderful? I said, Oh, yeah. I said, She'll be free. I said, Brenda will lead them. I said, She'll be free. And he said, Well, he said, You know, the Lord wants you to come to my church tomorrow and speak. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, but I don't believe in falling out. I said, you don't believe in falling out? He said, no. I said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, what if God tells me to pray for the sick? He says, well, he said, I know he wants you to come, though, but I don't believe in falling out, Brother Norval. Now, he's standing over talking to me about 11 o'clock at night, and they're still praying, see? About 11 o'clock at night, and he's still talking to me. He wants me to come to your church, but don't believe in falling out. He says, make up your mind, man. And so all of a sudden, the Holiday Inn manager came in the ballroom and that woman screamed at the top of her voice and there was 40 people praying in tongues. He kind of walks in kind of sheepishly and says, walks over to us, he says, Mr. Hayes, he says, what's going on over there? I said, where? He said, Oh, I said, that? That's not just everyday stuff. I said, they're just praying in tongues, and I says, to get that devil out. I said, no, no, don't worry about it, sir. I said, everything's all right. They're just praying for a woman that's, that's demon-possessed. And I said, the devils are coming out and leaving, leaving your motel. And he'd look back over that way, and he'd say, Oh. Okay. I said, oh yeah, don't worry about it. It's just everyday stuff with us. I said, we see it all the time, so don't worry about it. They're just praying, the devil's going to leave and then she'll be all right. He said, oh, okay. He'd walk, he'd, he'd look at me and he'd look at them. So oh yeah, all right, okay, be okay. Okay. 
He could walk a few more steps. He gets to the door and he's... Here's 40 people praying in tongues at the top of the voice and some, some demon this woman going, Ow! Calling Jesus all kinds of cursing names. And they're praying in tongues. And he, 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 he'd look at them. They'd look back at me. He gets the door, look back at me. Sure, sure. Come out and close the door. Another hour went by. Everybody said another hour. Sometimes you can't get heaven to come down real quick like. You have to have faith. Faith has patience, you know. Another hour goes by. Another hour. All of a sudden, Kathy's mother come in and said to me, she says, I'm still talking to this wild Pentecostal preacher that wants me to go to his church, but he don't believe in falling out. And he said, I have this big Jesus church, you know. I don't believe in falling out. And so her mother came to me and said, Brother Noble, Brother Noble, uh, the, the Holiday Inn manager come back at 12 o'clock. He says, well, now, it's the fire department that says that the ballroom has to be closed at 12 o'clock. It's strict orders. I said, what, what, what do you want to do with this woman? I said, oh, just wrap a sheet around her and drag her outside of the building. I said, well, she said, we can't pray for her in the lobby. We have to leave the ballroom. I said, that's okay. Get a sheet, Brenda. Now, see, Brenda, Kathy's mother is the type of woman, I can tell her to do something, and she'd do it. See, that's the kind of staff you want. We don't want to wear a flaky staff. Oh, well, I don't know. I do it. Well, this is where it's working. You know. <laughs> now, I can tell Brenda to do something, and she'd just do it, that's all. I said, Brenda, just go get a sheet, honey. I know what the Holy Ghost told me. And Jesus loves that woman. But the price has got to be paid. If they want to pay the price to pray, that's fine. If they don't, I'll come back and pray myself. I know Brenda stayed with me if we prayed all night. I said, get a sheet, wrap her up, drag her outside. Let her scream. Drag her outside. Take her through the lobby, drag her outside. Lay her, lay her, down, in the, lay her down out there in the grass. And take all the worries you can get with you and get around her and just pray. Hey, Brenda, listen to me, honey. Are you listening? I said, pray until God comes. You understand what I'm saying to you? She says, okay. All right. She says, that's what you want to do. I said, that's what I want to do. She says, okay, it'll be done. And it was too, brother. She went and got his sheet, wrapped that woman up in his sheet. <laughs> hey, she didn't want to be wrapped up, but you just have to know Brenda. Brenda wrapped her up anyway. <laughs> he said, two of you men get her on. You two men get her on. Put her leg down. Husband, put them legs together. Tie them together. <laughs> Go to the lobby. <laughs> Calling Jesus' name, screaming. Take her outside. Lay her down on the grass against the building outside. And just keep on praying. Brenda come back in a little while, you know. I finally told that guy I'd come to his church. So Brenda come back in about one o'clock and she says, she says, Brother Norval, she says, you've been speaking all week and there's no use in you staying up. She says, I've got this thing under control. And she says, I've got some prayer warriors out here and we're around this woman. We're going to pray until God comes just like you told us to. And why don't you just go ahead and get some sleep? I said, well, y'all think you got it under control? Oh, yeah, we got it under control. I said, well, thank you, Brenda. I'll go get some sleep. So I went to my room. Went to bed. About five minutes or two, Brenda come knocked on my door. I said, hello. She says, Brother Norval, come up in the lobby. She says, we were, we were praying. She was, we were praying. It was about two o'clock. She said, about five minutes or two, all of a sudden, just all of a sudden, out of heaven comes God's power and hit that woman and all the devil's left and she's totally free. She said, you've got to see this. She looks like an angel sitting up in the lobby. Norval, you need to see this. I said, yeah, I, I, that's right. I need to see it. So I got some clothes on. Went up there to the lobby and she was sitting there like this. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. That same girl now. Thank you, Jesus. She had cursed Jesus for about four hours. Called him all kinds of names. Satan worshiper. Worshiping the enemy of Jesus. But four hours of tongues... The same thing that Jesus said on Mount Olivet, don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. My brother and sister, you don't, if you want to be free from devils, you may think you need me. You don't need me, you need heaven. Well, I mean, I'll bind up the devil and, get his, and put the devil on the run, but you can get it yourself. Did you know that? You can change things yourself. But what? Claiming your freedom in Jesus' name and praying in tongues until God comes.
And when God comes, brother, His power will go through you. And I went up there, and, and, and so I, I knelt down. I said, how you doing, honey? She says, oh, thank you, Mr. Hayes, for praying for me. She said, thank you for praying for me. She said, oh, I feel like, I feel like I've been tore up on the inside. But she said, I feel so good on the inside. She said, I feel so good. My, my mind is clear. And I'm so free. She said, I'm so free. She said, oh, God. Jesus, I thank you so much. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Mr. Hayes, this is the first time in years that I've been myself. I've been, I've been another human being, stalking in the darkness for over three years, being led by unseen power that would make me do all kinds of evil things. And she says, that power has been broken over me. And she said, there's another power in me now that loves me. I said, yeah, you said that right. The Holy Spirit loves you, honey. He loves you just like Jesus loves you. And I said, He will give you life itself and everything that you want, He will give it to you. And He, the Holy Spirit, knows how to get the will of God for the saints. How to get the will of God for the saints. In Jesus' name. And some of the men here want to do something for you right now. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to help and scatter this crowd around. I'd like to do it a different way. But uh, I need to turn the service back over to them shortly. But before I do, right now, in Jesus' name, I want you, you can do it just as well there as you can anyplace else. Now, if I had a lot of time, it would be a different situation. But right now, if devils has been bothering you, or you have disease, or the devil has been bothering you in Jesus' name, all I want you to do is hold up both hands just like this. If you know that devils have been bothering you, and disease has been bothering you, hold up your hands about like this. Just keep them up, not like this. All right? Now keep your hands up. Now, when they start praying, I want two or three people around them to reach over and touch them and start doing the same thing for them. But right now, I'm talking about you yourself. Now, you yourself. I want you to say, in Jesus' name, name, I've come this afternoon afternoon for total victory. victory. And I know know that the Holy Spirit knows how to heal me, knows how to to set me free from devils, devils. in Jesus' name, name. and I am going to get the victory. Victory Victory is mine, mine. in Jesus' name. Now, you you that have your hands up, I want you to keep your hands up now, and I want you to close your eyes. Don't look, look around. And for a few seconds now, before we start, I want you to think about Jesus. I want you to... Don't don't think about the things you've been thinking about. Think about Jesus. I want you to think about heaven. The little picture of heaven that I told you about tonight. Think about heaven. And think about total victory. And think about Jesus and heaven. Jesus and heaven. Total victory. Get victory thoughts in your mind. Think about Jesus. He's victory. Think about heaven. Heaven is victory, my brother and sister. Think about that with your mind. Think about don't think about your shape. Think about heaven. Think about Jesus. Now, all of a sudden, just keep your hands up and your eyes closed. You don't have your hands up. Keep your eyes closed. And just as loud as you can. Now, don't strain your voice. Get it at a happy medium. Right now, Jesus. Now, if you can't pray in tongues, I want you to start praying in English. And then later on, I want you to ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and pray in tongues. But right now, just as loud as you possibly can and strong, I want you to start praying in tongues. Just as hard and fast as you can. Love that person. information on other materials by Dr. Hayes, please contact Normal Hayes Book and Tape Production, P.O. Box 1379, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37364-1379, or call area code 615-476-1018. Thank you.